It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. True currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. And and just smile and pretend that everything is smooth as silk. And uh, we'll get... Oh, it is. It is it right is. now. That's what we were saying. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, how y'all doing? Wow, we had <laughs> we had a storm last night in this area. At a nor'easter uh, came blowing through. Oh, my goodness. I, I think it was a nor'wester. Was it? Yeah, I think so. It's a nor'wester. Uh, arr. Arr, off the plane. No, wait, it's not April or that's September. Whatever. Uh, September, no. You know, I, I just spend the whole year looking forward to international talk like a pirate day. That's In fact, we try to do it every week. I think that should be a national holiday. I think we should, <laughs> we can get rid of a couple of the ones that we have now mm. and uh, and go with that. Um, ah. Welcome, everybody. I hope you all survived the storm. One of our guests said that her internet got <laughs> knocked out this morning, so she was uh, uh, in a little bit of a panic, but we got it. We made it work. I mean, I didn't do anything. I didn't make anything work here. I just sort of... Uh, oh, yeah, you did. You got it all working. Yeah, yeah you're right. You you're know up what? there on uh, the roof, moving the aerial, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, holding <laughs> the uh, the aluminum foil at, at angles. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Wearing the tin foil hat. Um, like, uh, my, my friends on the right, uh, and, uh, whatever else, uh, Hey, if we, we've got a great show for you today, uh, by the way, Peggy, all that stuff that, um, that wasn't up there yesterday on the uh, blog post is now up on the blog post. Uh, so folks go, uh, in the, in the 10 o'clock hour, Peggy and I will do our usual, oh, that stuff. Okay. Our, our potpourri. Yeah. You probably looked at it and went, how come that's not up there? And yeah, I looked at that and said, oh, wow, well, that's a short blog this week. But yeah, yeah, that's a short. No, it's it's longer now because uh, Uncle Mike got up early to do this. Uncle Mike went to bed late and got up early, uh, which is Make never up for it. yep. it's never a good thing for the show. But uh, so, so like if you nod off in the middle of a spot. Right. Exactly. Just kind of. <laughs> oh, hi, kids. I'll be like. Uh, uh, wake <laughs> yeah, up. I know, wake really. Up. Just just your. Just, <laughs> is 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 uh is what you need to do if i i, I don't think See, i have a disadvantage to us not being in the studio together if you nod off i can't just like wake up wake up wake up hey yeah you, you well you know i i wish you could just pop in something like shut this. up wesley all right and then you just do this the the smack and that and that should uh wake me up oh okay. Okay. Uh, or we can let our next guest do that too. You know what? I think I, we we will do that. And by the way, our our next guest is a is a fellow who's been on the show before. I should say, before I introduce our next guest, we'll, we'll go to nine thirty because uh, we're going to be talking about uh, something that uh, is uh, going on online. Um, it is um, a garden festival of sorts, the Great Grow Along. Um, and uh, our friend Lamanda Joy, who's been associated with Peterson Garden Project, who has been on our show before, um, is uh, part of that. And uh, we also have one of the presenters uh, uh, who's going to be uh, at the Great Grow Along. By the way, Doug Tallamy is one of the presenters at the Great Grow Along, though he's not on our show this morning. Not but this week. He'll, not this week. He's, he's going to be back uh, very, very soon at the very beginning of April. So we're, we're going to talk to him again. But uh, Nicole Burke 
has a, a site called Gardenary, and we'll explain what that means uh, when she comes on, and they will be talking about uh, the great grow-along. And I keep wanting to, to say other th- the, oh, the, the great garden, you know, and I, at, at the, as I was writing the blog post, uh, different permutations of that were going, I could never get it right. I always had to go back and look. It's a great mm-hmm. grow-along, so, which it's not... It's like there could be a song surrounding that. It's not that hard to say, really. And, of course, meteorologist Rick DeMaio will be here uh, at uh, uh, 1030 to um, tell us why w- the winds blew as they did last Help night. Help us pick up all the giant branches in some of the yards, yes. Uh, yeah, as, I hope so. And, as, uh, uh, and Alexandra says, giant branches in the yard. Oh, right. Giant branches mm-hmm. in the yard. Well, and, and I had my uh, water containers, which I had emptied of compost yesterday in the yard to, to air them out once you uh, uh, empty the compost. And they're all over the yard, too, just scattered all over the yard. So there you go. All right. Yeah, let's... I had a lot of standing water after the rain, but it seems to have gone down. So that's Well, that's good. Thing. I'm glad to hear that. All right, let's go to our our guest uh, before uh, he falls asleep on us, or or his uh, or be, or before his uh, internet goes out because of the storm. Uh, Chris Beatty's. Can, can you possibly bring his image down? Um, no, he can How bring the image down. Go. There we go. That. That's perfect. That's uh, absolutely. We don't want to cut the top of your head off, and if you're listening on the podcast, it doesn't matter anyway. So um, Chris Beatty is from Grower Talks. It's one of the, I believe, 600. Okay, this is an old one, but product oh, placement. Oh, I got a, I've got an old one here too. Which there is you that, go. I have a new one, but I think it's in my car. Um, yeah, I don't Grower think I've got. You'll have to, you'll have to get, uh, you'll have to get Marshall to uh, provide a little. In- little incentive to you for for that uh, publicity there Peggy. yeah you can you can see that this is an older one because it's got a christmas tree in it um uh, and uh yeah. but I think uh, the other one's in my car so i don't have the current one well grower talks is a publication of ball horticultural company uh some people call it just ball hort and um and they have i believe 650 different magazines and websites <laughs> all all of which end up in my inbox um you guys have a lot of different publications going on you have green talks you have grower talks you have green profit um on and on and on and they're all i guess chris and 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 chris is uh you're the the editor um for how I, many i kind of run the i kind of run the show there uh, the, yeah. the, the shorter the title the more the responsibility so just editor <laughs> I, but i do run mm-hmm. ball publishing for ball horticultural company and it's a it, my magazine grower talks goes back to 1937 Holy right smoke. here in chicago land covering the covering the really the world of of the horticulture industry for the industry it's a trade magazine um and uh, so that you get some inside you know tr- uh, sneak peeks at uh, at everything going on within my industry that you can then share with your mm-hmm. your your listeners so. well, well you we'll know talk a little bit about that today, we can share that with them but they I'll tell you, folks reading that would get a lot of information that would be relevant to them, even yeah. if they're not in the business. Uh, for instance, one of the things we're going to talk about on the show is peat moss and whether mm-hmm. uh, peat moss is sustainable. Um, yes, mm-hmm. you, ta- you talk about uh, business trends and that sort of thing, but there's a mm-hmm. lot of practical horticultural information that comes through. Mm-hmm. I love reading the Green Talks. I've been trying to get your editor of Green Talks on, but unfortunately, she she's like in Wyoming or something in her inter- <laughs> Missoula, Montana, which is uh, a good place oh, to be okay. a, a sustainability enough. editor. Yeah. Yeah. So, so well, it's a good Jen, place. Jenny for- White. Yeah. Jenny White. Jenny She'll White. Do it. She'll do well, it. no, yeah. we talked and she said, I, I don't trust my internet here. Um, and so. Oh, there is that. Okay, yeah. Good. She's in Missoula, Montana. So. Missoula, Mon- although Missoula. <laughs> and the wind blows there too. Yeah, it does. You <laughs> know, it's funny. We talked about, we talked about the wind uh, last night. Yesterday was such a beautiful first day of March to get out. Oh my and goodness. Start, feel like you could garden again, right? Yeah. Rake. I saw my neighbors raking and cleaning things up. Mm-hmm. Now they've got to start over after that windstorm. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and and raking at this time of year is 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 a little early anyway because there's st- in my backyard there's still muck, um, and and it's I'm t- futile, but it feels good to do. I'm it. Just well, yeah. the smell of the dirt. Yes. Yeah, there's something, but you know, in in the part of the house which is on just uh, uh or bad part of the yard which is just north of the house, um, I was scratching around in the dirt and it was frozen. 
underneath. It was just a block of ice. So there's you're not going to plant anything yet. That's no, for no nothing's going to happen. We talked about that last week with the Lisa yeah. Hilgenberg. Well, you could put the spinach and the cilantro in, in containers. In containers, yeah. and you can get those out. Yeah, and my uh, and it and it's and it's official. My parsley survived the winter under my makeshift. It's a weird makeshift row Ooh. cover. It's one, just one of those plastic container boxes mm -hmm. that you get at the container store and you put your clothes in. Mm -hmm. I just turned it upside down, put it over, and it survived all of the snow. You're welcome. And the, uh, You're no, welcome. No, there was Peggy's. <laughs> well, you have actual row covers. I don't have, I just, I just made it up as I went along. Hey, so, whatever works. Whatever um, works. So the parsley has survived, and it looks like some of the baby chard has survived as well. So. Well, it that's that one is still a little iffy, but the definitely uh, the uh, the parsley. I'm just I'm stunned. I'm absolutely stunned. So. Now, how? But but for for me, it's always who's got the earliest tomato. Me and my gardening friends <laughs> have an informal competition. Really? And for okay. a while, we were the winner of the first ripe tomato of the season. We got to uh, keep the Roger Swain bobblehead. <laughs> <Which, Yeah. laughs> <All right>. was... <laughs> wow there's a blast from the past the roger swain bob okay. i want one of those i'm i might have to enter this competition um you know Alrighty. at least it wasn't a jerry baker bobblehead <laughs> no um, i've not, I've not seen, i don't think he's is he worthy of a of, a, of, a, of his own bobblehead I you got to so. really achieve a certain status to right own, exactly own bobblehead yeah not that i know anything about about that Oh, but, uh, look at that. That's a whole other matter. Yeah. Okay. Right. For my, for my well, staff. <laughs> that's all the time we have, everybody. Uh, good night. Um, so no, uh, Chris Badius is here because he knows a lot about the biz. And I said, you know what? What's it look like going into 2022? Um, yeah, and the state uh, of the union, as it and, were. And we know, and Lisa talked about it. Lisa Hilgenberg from the Chicago Botanic Garden was on last week, and we talked about uh, the interest in gardening over the last couple of years. Pandemic certainly pushed that. Um, the world, Peggy and I were talking this week, the world is in crisis, and when things go into crisis mode, people go into their yards and they think about growing their own uh, or they think about beautifying uh, because they need a sense of solace in their lives. Um, so uh, what is the state of the industry in, as we go into 2022, Chris? Uh, well, Mike, I think you spelled it out pretty, uh, pretty accurately there. Um, people started gardening in the pandemic for a lot of reasons. Some for food security. They kind of thought that, my gosh, uh, if, you know, I can't find tomatoes at the grocery store. Maybe I'll grow my own. And then maybe they found out just how tricky, tricky that is to do. Um, also, we saw tremendous sales in 2020 of things like vegetables. I think people were buying an entire flats of tomatoes, uh, tomato seedlings which as you and I know, you need maybe a couple of plants to, uh, to take care of a family. So maybe they overproduced and then they didn't buy as many last year. The only thing that didn't sell us, the garden centers didn't sell as much of uh, in 2021 as they did in 2020 was, uh, was vegetable plants. An interesting little factoid there. But I love that people have discovered gardening. Yeah, that's true. And, um, and uh, there's no sign that, that people are giving up gardening for many reasons just because uh, hopefully they you know they've they, they've they've found the fun of it to me gardening it's just a plain fun to do it it's very satisfying to grow something on your own especially if it's you know you can then serve it to your friends eat it or just be, look at the beautiful flowers or whatever it is so um we are looking as an industry at at uh, 2022 being a good year a uh, you know because we've got a lot of new customers out there in 2021 survey that i read estimated 16 to 20 million new gardeners coming into the uh, into the fold right uh, which is great it also put a that, that put a lot of stress on supply because um plants are not widgets and if you're a if you're a commercial grower producing for garden centers you have to get seeds and and, and small plants from your suppliers who then have to produce them someplace and uh, and you have to forecast sometimes years in advance to have the, the, the quantity of seed that you need or of cuttings for vegetative varieties um, and whatever you forecast, that's what you have. You can't suddenly ramp up and make a half million more or a half billion more. So it, so it, it meant 
garden centers ran out of product. Um, we've yeah. caught up with that in most cases. So, um, so what I was trying to, I was, as, as you invited me to talk about this, I thought, well, what are your, what are your listeners going to be uh, seeing and experiencing when they go to the, to the garden centers mm -hmm. this spring? Um, they're going to see a lot of houseplants. Houseplants yes. have remained really popular for the mm -hmm. for for a lot of reasons part of it is the home office thing or the the work from home thing you know you, you, you everybody knows you want a, a plant or two around you as you work or in your play areas if you don't know that try it and you'll you'll wonder how in the world did i go so long without without some house plants mm -hmm. yeah um there's also the whole pinterest and instagram trend yeah. especially with younger people of yeah. you know just like out out uh, house planting each other you know plant yeah. parents is a big thing so when you go to your garden center you go back into the house plant area you're going to see it bigger and more beautiful than ever especially with some of the really trendy things like the, the monsteras and the other philodendrons yeah. and you know sort of the the uh, the collectible kinds of things uh, once in a while you hear these crazy stories of somebody spending you know six thousand dollars on a you know a stem with a leaf on it Cutting great yes. if you get it, but, uh, cutting, yes. Yeah, but I think um, we talked about that the last time you yeah. were on the show. There yeah, was look five... on Etsy if you want to see some yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there right. was a, there was a five thousand dollar house plant. Uh, I sold, I think, either in Australia or New Zealand. It, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I hope it I, went to a to a to a, a really solid uh, gardener who who knew how to how to nurture you know, that into you know, no, uh, three it, or four it, leaves, and it didn't just. Croak and, after, and resell them. a couple of weeks. <laughs> no, and not what I was thinking is that it went to somebody who immediately overwatered it and uh, killed it. You know, and this is what this is what people do with when they're new to house plants. They're watering them every other day, or you know. Can I share a tip or two on that one, real quick? Yeah, go uh, for because it. I spent a lot of time on, uh, and I've been in the industry forty years. A lot of it in Florida. My wife is a professional horticulturist. We have hundreds of plants downstairs in our sunroom and in our basement, so we know a little bit about it. I won't say we know. About everything because you yeah. learn something new every day but i spent a lot of time on a on some houseplant um forums on facebook houseplant groups and invariably people bring a plant home from any place and they immediately want to repot it because they think mm -hmm. the soil is no good um <laughs> and the, and so i i've given up weighing in because they just poo poo me but um but i tell them you know that especially if you've bought it at a well really anywhere you buy it whether it's a you know a, a big box store or an independent garden center the growers who are growing these things professionally are in the business to put it in the best possible <laughs> soil so that so that the 10,000 or 10 million they have in their greenhouse depending on the size of operation they are all thrive and are all sellable and yet for some reason um and especially new new gardeners seem to think that that a grower is going to put it in the cheapest soil possible and so they immediately need to change it out and then what they change it out into is something some crazy homemade mix with 47 different ingredients that you can never replicate and the plant doesn't know what to do with and i said just leave it alone bring it home put it in a nice spot water it when it looks like it need, when it's dry and and then Take when you kill it, it go buy three more because that's how my <laughs> wife does it. <laughs> and killing a plant, which invariably happens. In fact, I brought home a, a fairly new, not rare, but, but un, you know, fairly rare plant to my wife. And I asked recently, what happened to that, uh, that philodendron I brought you? It was a philodendron Birkin, which is, a, it's not new, but it's, it's kind of nice. She said, oh, I killed it. So just, <laughs> okay. Not on she purpose. Just, but, yeah, she killed didn't, it, but she didn't but, murder but it. Excuse, no, it just is. She neglected it one time too many, which sometimes to happens me. when you have hundreds yes. of plants. But so it's an excuse for her to go buy three or four more. Your point, so. <laughs> though, is really good because it never occurred to me. Now, I've, I've learned something new just now that folks assume that the soil is not going to be good. I have always assumed this is the best soil I'm going to have ever for this plant. So let's keep it in there as long as you possibly can. And then maybe amend it a little bit in a few years. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right. Not, My, I, <laughs> I spoke yeah. to my niece uh, just recently. I was in California, my, and my phone rang. It was my niece in South Carolina. She wanted some, some house plant advice. She had a little succulent on her kitchen windowsill. First ever succulent. Perfect first plant. Windowsill, kitchen. Mm -hmm. Sounds ideal. She said it was doing great. It's been just been going great. It's been growing and wonderful and this and that. And she said, I water it once a week, and it's fine. I said, good. You seem to have a system going. She says, I repotted it. And now it's doing terribly. I said, why in the world did you repot it? Well, it was growing and I thought it needed repotting. No, it didn't need repotting. I said, are you still watering it once a week? 
Yeah, well, there's your problem. You've got twice as much soil, twice as much water now. That poor little plant is now drowning. And uh, so I scolded her for, you, you know, especially succulents. They have small root systems. Until the, until the pot falls over from the weight of a plant, you probably don't need to repot it. And, and the plant's and, coming out the bottom. <laughs> and, yeah. But you know what? Then again, I also always say there are no rules with plants. You own that plant. You're the boss. Do whatever you want and see what Wait, happens. No, no, the plant if you want to water rules. it with aquarium second. water, that's fine. Yeah. You know, if you think, uh, you know, should I name brands? The, the one that starts with M, you know, in the stores, if you think that's, <laughs> you know, the devil's spawn soil, fine. You can do whatever you want. I've used lots of that M branded stuff. It's okay. But so your plants, you do what you want, but learn. Whatever you do, learn from it. If you kill a plant, try to figure out why did I kill it? Too much water, too little water. It's usually yeah. one of those things, as you said, Mike. So, uh, other than I, but a couple plant. of other things you can. Go ahead, Good segue. Peg. I was going to say annual. When it comes to annuals, you know, for your for your for your spring garden, there may be uh, some shortages on a few things. Mm -hmm. ah. um, I've just heard recently, as the growers are complaining, "Hey, how come I can't get this?" As the growers are looking for seed or mm -hmm. what's called yeah. a plug. A plug is a is a little seedling because it's very tricky to to to. You know, we find, think seed is easy, throw it in the ground and it germinates. Right. But if you have you know hundreds of thousands of plants. Suppose uh, you you only get 90% germination instead of 100% germination. Mm -hmm. Well, 10% of your crop is gone. That's that's pretty expensive. So yeah. um, so a lot of growers buy pre-germinated little plantlets called plugs. But anyway, that's uh, stuff people don't need to know. But um, open pollinated seed varieties, for instance, alyssum is one, mm -hmm. and marigolds. Those are two things that you might not see as many of in your garden center, especially the alyssum early, early spring. If you, if you always, I love it as, a, as an early, early plant, you know, yeah. or pink cascades yeah. out of my yeah. pots. It, it's, um, it might be in, in a little bit uh, rare supply just because the demand was so strong last year and the year before, the, the producers of the seed have, have had a challenge ramping up enough supply of the parent yeah. stock that creates the seed there's only so much space to do this open pollinated production a lot of it happens um in other countries chile is a is a big one because they've got their summer time for producing seed while it's winter up here mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so so it might be uh, those are things you might want to if you see it buy it because oh, it might be okay I, about, I, 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 I have another I, sh quick shortage question though oh okay, make quick. it short because we're getting behind with, here well with all, all right. of the the shipping delays and yes, you know, I was going to say about that too. Delays, how is that affecting nursery stock? Okay. Well, it's 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 going to raise the price more than anything because most of these things are uh, almost everything is produced here, and even those things that are produced as as seed or young plants offshore somewhere, a lot in Mexico, Central America, um, they're flown up here, and and the delays are maybe a week or something like that. It's not it's not bad for a, as other things. Um, but the cost of some things, for instance, landscape plants often come from the West Coast, like uh, Oregon, or they come from the Carolinas, and trucking costs are, uh, are much higher. They're surcharges, so you may see things being a little bit more expensive, but the availability should be okay, as provided they can, they can find the, the trucks for these things. Okay. Now, um, garden and patio decor, which has to come from somewhere in Asia, and, and depends on a on a boat and a and shipping container. container from yes. Those things may be in shorter supply. Um, and although although the garden centers are ordering way in advance to try to make up for that, mm -hmm. so they may be in shorter supply uh, and a bit more expensive as well because cargo containers that used to cost three thousand dollars now cost twenty thousand dollars, and that adds a lot to the price of a patio set. Um, and so, and, and the, the last thing I think you're going to see at the garden center that's sort of, um, you know, pandemic and, and inflation oriented um, is just simple prices across the board because growers uh, uh, of plants are, are subject to the same kinds of price increases everyone is. Oil has caused the, the cost of plastic and fertilizer to go up. Labor is, is, is much more expensive. Uh, everybody wants to pay 15 or 18 dollars per hour and is doing so, but that has to come out of the, the cost of the plant. Same at the, the retail side. So, so you might right. see plant prices a little bit higher. But, but I wanted to leave people thinking, you know, uh, plants are still 
inexpensive for all the value that they bring to you, yeah. the quality that they add to your life. Um, so it's still one of the, you know, still sure. best deal you know, you're going to have. Even if you spend 35, 40 bucks on a plant, um, it's, it adds so much to, to your home and to, and to your life. And, and besides, and you, to don't your enjoyment buy, of the plant. you don't want to buy $300 worth of plants because you want to keep that $35 plant alive. Um, and if you can do that, then you move on to other things. Now I want to get and to the, the, you want to keep your, wait, the, but I want to say the third, the third generation owner of, of I've lost company, control of this Anna conversation Ball. somehow. You, I don't you right, know, you Anna Ball, go. but that's what this Anna Ball yes. says that, that plants are the only thing that you can buy that add to our world. They improve our world as you own them and grow them. Okay. Name something else that does that. Although a friend of mine just said, what about pizza? Hmm, that's a tough one, but okay. then we started, well, beer, I don't know. Okay, go ahead, Mike. Uh, you know, see, and, <laughs> and, and then when you, you do that, um, I just, I, I just, <laughs> I, I just have to, to pop up something like Shut that. up, Wesley. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Um, very Pete quickly. Moss. Uh, Pete Moss. Well, no, no, let's say sustainability in general, because we've had a couple of comments come in. Um, first of all, Bruce Bruce, who says, you know, when you're talking about digging in your yard, he says, I'm digging a fallout shelter. Okay, good. Glad, you, glad you're doing that. But that'll keep you busy and it'll keep you healthy. Um, but uh, Greg said, please tell the industry to stop using neonicotinoids on plants that are known for pollinators. And obviously that's a concern. I mean, the industry is trying to be sustainable. That's why, um, it, you know, and if we don't get too far into the conversation about peat moss, please go to my blog post because I put a couple of links there. Uh, one from your magazine, it's, it's actually the title story of this one mm -hmm. is peat sustainable. And there's been a debate raging about that now for a couple of decades. Um, and uh, I know the Canadian growers, we get most of our peat from Canada, uh, are very conscious of this. You can't even get peat in Europe, um, it, or they're starting to ban it. Let me put it that way, although it's been harder during the pandemic. That's part of the article. It's really a fascinating article. Mm -hmm. People should read it. But And Peggy sent me one earlier this week about the Congo and the discovery of peat bogs in the Congo mm -hmm. that have gone under the radar and now folks are afraid they're going to be exploited and harvested. I mean, this is, this is stuff we have to, to think about because peat is a carbon sink. It just grabs that. It holds on to the carbon mm -hmm. and doesn't release it. And if we exploit them too much, the carbon goes into our atmosphere. But what about mm -hmm. neonicotinoids um, and, and the average consumer? Sure. They are, they are being phased out. Um, and every grower I know, is, is doing it their best to move away from it. Um, there are, uh, are a lot of new products out there, much safer chemistries uh, to use now, safer for, um, for the workers and safer for the environment. And uh, growers are, are doing a lot more with biological controls too. Um, we've been writing about it since I've started the magazine 28 years ago. I only wrote a tiny bit about it early on because growers weren't using it very much, but now it's a big part of what we do. So, so growers are moving away from that. I can't speak to other uh, areas of agriculture and how they're using it, but, uh, but that's, that's being phased out and the products being used today are so much, so much safer all the way around than what I used when I was a grower uh, 30 years ago in, in Florida. Well, you know, and um, I, I know a person who understands that is Dan Costa, who's watching and he's commented a couple of times. He says coconut <coughs> core, core, how do you pronounce core? Is it core? Core. Yeah, core? coconut okay. core. Is, he says yeah, it's the getting problem it's, not, it's the pro the challenge with core is is um is uniformity and quality in both cases there's there's been some really bad core shipped up to growers that's full of salt and other other you know kinds of things that can damage the plants so so core is an alternative to peat another really promising one now that's being used a lot is is uh wood fiber um there's uh, uh, there's quite a bit of that being used and blended in with potting mixes. I think you'll even be able to find it uh, in the mixes at garden centers, not as a full peat replacement, but as a as an additive. So maybe your mix is now 50% um, peat, 50% um, wood fiber. All right. And uh, one of the one of the yeah. But uh, but, but do you want to talk about that that article? Some of the statistics I think would be would be interesting. Well, the, the I'll put it in perspective. Okay, the statistics I put it in perspective is that of the uh, millions of acres of uh, peat in. Uh, hold on, let me find this because it's two hundred and seventy-five million acres of peat in Canada, 
and only 60,000 acres have been harvested over the last 90 Which years. Which is three tenths, three hundredths of one percent of the peat, available peat that's harvested each year. And they're moving towards the idea of replacing those uh, peat uh, lands and, uh, and not uh, harvesting from there again and, and, right and they don't right. har- once once they restore them they don't harvest again okay we're just about out of time I, I i advise people to go to the blog post and read the story or pick up a copy uh, go to grower talks you can go online um and what would be yeah, the growertalks.com there you go growertalks.com grower and if you search uh, Canadian peat, probably that article will, will yeah, come up. Yeah, it pops pretty, right pretty up. Okay. There. but I It want... was the January issue, correct? Yep, January it was. January issue. Yep. All right. And then this very quickly. Ooh. Yes, look at those. <laughs> those, our folks, are impatience. And uh, I... Double and I, impatience. Double impatience. And I will admit I'm kind of an impatient snob, but I might be tempted to grow these. Um, this is a top you're, secret you're photo. How did you get a hold of that, Mike? Um, I know a guy at Grower Talks. <laughs> Uh, just to let you know, okay. Um, well, my, we- my job is pretty. My job is pretty fun. I travel the world looking at flowers. And last week, I was in California shooting video for my sister companies of their newest introductions. And this was the one that was most exciting to me. It's called Glimmer Double Impatience. Uh, Double Impatience have been around for quite a while. There used to be a series called Fiesta. It was very, very popular. But they are susceptible to impatience downy mildew, right. which is the disease that hit impatience around the world, out of the blue, for no apparent reason, about 10 or so years ago. I mean, the, the UK, South Africa, Australia, places that are big users of imp- and and the US, of course. And uh, a few years back, um, one of my sister companies uh, introduced a new impatience called Beacon that is resistant, highly resistant, in fact, to impatience downy mildew. Now they've got a double impatience that is also highly resistant to impatience downy mildew, and it's called Glimmer. Uh, six different colors, great item for the shade, for the ground, or I, I think doubles are better in pots where you can really enjoy the, uh, you know, the flowers up close. Um, and yeah. these are not, I don't think these are going to be in garden centers this spring. This is actually a 2023 introduction. Um, so, so at next week I'll be in California, or excuse me, I'll be in Florida looking at some more new varieties. And then in about three weeks, I'll be back to California looking at all of the new varieties from all of the breeding companies. And I can give your listeners a sneak peek at Top these, secret which website. is pretty rare. Top secret. If you go to, jot this down, if you go to CaliforniaTrials.com, www.CaliforniaTrials.com, in about the first week of April, uh, me and my my uh, team of editors will be posting daily updates, daily uh, emails and videos from California, which is basically like the, 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 the it's called, it's called CAST, California Spring Trials. And it's uh, like the spring fashion show, fashion fair, Mm -hmm. fashion week, I guess I should say, uh, for the flower industry. And you'll get to see all kinds of things that are not going to be available until until 2023, but it's, it's a lot of fun and we have fun Uh, doing it. Okay. And uh, my, my, maybe my snobbishness with uh, impatience has to do with uh, earlier in my life when I was, uh, I became a master gardener and then I started working for some some landscapers and one in particular would throw a dozen flats of impatience uh, at me and say, plant those under that tree. And that, you know, and that, and that was all she'd say and she'd go away and I, I would be there for the rest of the day planting hundreds of impatience under Having a tree. Had impatience thrown at you. Yeah, exactly. I don't know, but that's, that's the way it works. And, and then of course they got wiped out by, as you say, the, the downy mildew, but now they're back. Um, okay. They are back, but if you don't want to garden with them, you don't have to. There are no rules, Mike. I've just told you that. No rules. There's plenty <laughs> no of other rules. plants Plus out there. Then there's then there's more impatience for the rest of us. Exactly. Exactly. Can, That's can, the way. Can I, I toss in a? Can I it, it, on a closing note? Can I yes. toss in a real quick quote from George Ball that I saw up on Grower Talks? Go from Chris Beatties. Um, George Ball was speaking um, in in Wall Street Journal. He says we have become a harmonious nation of gardeners. Fractiousness and conflict be gone. Goodbye, digital age. The gardening age has begun. Ah, well, I, George, he's a wise man. He's, oh, uh, there were there were some uh, others. Anna Ball's brother back in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Oh, is is that what it was? And then you he wrote... owns uh, W. Atley Burpee, the Burpee Burpee Seed Company. Ah, uh, 
Well, I, I, there were some other quotes that you wrote in the January issue that I thought were pretty funny, uh, and I won't be able to find them now. Um, it, there was, <laughs> you know, about doing stupid things in, in, in your business or in your garden, and I related to them. Let me just say that. I just, I just completely <laughs> related to that. All right, uh, Chris Bates, thank you so much for being with We're going to have, I always say this, but let's have you back. Yeah, after the California trial, after California Fashion Week, we got to get you back, Chris. We'll do that. Okay. Anytime. You know, you guys know where to find me. I love doing this. Okay. Happy to, great. Happy to be on the air with you. Have a great day. Uh, the uh, great grow along is next. Please stick around. Any minute now, it's going to crack and open beneath you. This is such a dangerous environment. I wanted to put together an expedition that brings together women from the Arab world and the West. And we're going to ski to the North Pole. Two years, this has changed a lot in my life, this expedition. From spring seed and soil treatments, to summer foliar feeding, to fall stubble digesters, Blazing Star provides microbial tools from tiny biologicals for natural and organic farmers. They have solutions for home gardeners too. And Blazing Star offers agroecological education and consulting, especially for permaculture work in zones four and five. Learn more about these great folks at blazing-star.com. And there you have it. Uh, the Great Grow Along is uh, coming up this week, March 11th through the 20th. And we have the founder of the Great Grow Along in the lower left screen. That's Lamanda Joy, who uh, has been on our show many times. Also, uh, president of City Grange, pr uh, founder and president emeritus, I saw recently, of Peterson Garden Project. Um, and um, you teach people how to grow. That's what you do. And it's good to see you, Amanda. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here. Peggy, uh, your hair is so long. <laughs> yes. I know. I, I look I at Peggy. And I th into Go ahead. No, it just it's that 40s look that you have going now. Um, 40s? Which, yeah, that's kind of a lot of hair in the 40s. If, if, if you ask me, kind of looked like that is the longish longer i don't know am i am i wrong i don't know it just, just seems that way to me okay uh, um, Do i get to wear the cool like the shoulder pad yeah well, you, well then you would be bringing back the 80s um 
No, which, no, no, but that was after the 40s wardrobe. No, I know that. I know. It was the, the, the 80s brought back the 40s, and then you would be bringing back the 80s. Am I right about that, Lamanda? I think I am. Um, I think all the talk of the flower fashions has got you, you know, just thinking about fashion, Mike. Yeah, yeah I guess so. Uh, and in the lower right you screen. You haven't seen Mike's hair, by the way, Lamanda. No. Oh, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> oh, oh, she did. She did. During the, when, when we did the uh, setup the other day, I gave her the, the, well, the hair the, tour. The, yeah, right. Exactly. The mountain man look, uh, as Kathleen calls it. Uh, in our lower uh, right corner there, Nicole. that's uh, Nicole Burke. Uh, sorry you have to put up with all of this, Nicole. She's the founder of Gardenary Inc. and uh, Rooted Garden. Welcome. And uh, she's bringing back the kitchen garden to uh, our, yes. our world. Um and uh, and I love the the decor. I am assuming that you put those together yourself. Yes, from my garden. Uh, from oh, from your garden as well. In fact, let's uh, let's get the uh, the wide shot here. There we go. Now you get to see those uh, wonderful Ooh, reeds. Okay, so this is uh, lemon balm. Ah. This is bay laurel. Yep. And then this is a lot of uh, herbs in the mint family. So you've got um, more lemon balm, some rosemary, oregano. There's some um, anise hyssop. I um, I used to be a southern gardener. So this is the way I survive winter now that I live in Chicago. Uh -huh. <laughs> so when did you uh, come to Chicago? So my family moved the summer of 2018. My husband is an organic chemist. So um, the challenging part is we move, we've moved quite a bit for his career. The beneficial part is I've gotten to learn how to garden in a lot of different climates from Philadelphia to Virginia, uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, to Nashville, Tennessee, to Houston, Texas, to here in the Chicago area. Yeah, you know, that's a really good point because what I, and I talk about this a lot on the show, I had a vacation home in the Pacific Northwest for almost a couple of decades. Uh, I learned more about gardening uh, by by being in zone, a wet zone eight, and then coming back to Chicago than you do just being in one zone. You you begin to understand how plants work uh, in, in ways that uh, you never imagined before so yeah it's a good thing yeah. to move from one uh growing zone to another uh let's get back to uh the great grow along though i want to get to kitchen gardens in a second but uh we just mm -hmm. saw that uh wonderful piece that uh, you guys put together um and it's That's and it, amazing. yeah and it, it seems to be a trend uh that uh garden event any event uh, goes over more than one day now. And I think it has to do with being online and, and grabbing people for maybe a couple of hours a day rather than making them sit for eight hours at, at, at an event and, and absorb everything in one day. If you do it over time, I think it's a little easier. And then you get to pick and choose. Uh, did you have that in mind when you were putting this together, Lamanda? Yeah, well, we did this event last year and we had 40 plus speakers and we crammed it into three days and it was a production um, <laughs> challenge, shall we say. Okay. So um, some of the feedback, you know, a lot of this year's event is really edited and chained based on feedback from last year and people wanted to see more stuff. You know, one of the things that's great about this event is that it allows people to connect with the presenters in the chat and the uh, live Q&A. And last year they were just piled on top of each other so people couldn't really participate in that way so this year we thought we'd make it easier on ourselves from a production standpoint mm -hmm. but also spread it out so people have more fun and also you know as we've lived through uh you know two years of zoom many people you know short bits are a lot better than you know <laughs> yeah. a long day because people yeah. are doing their work lives on you know days online what yeah. you, you, and, you're, and you're, you also will have go ahead I was going to say, and, and, and you also have, you can, you've got the short bits, but you've got the on-demand portion too, that, you know, short right, bits, yes. but you can, even if you can't make it, you can go back and, and get all of it later. Exactly. Exactly. And the speakers are so great. I mean, I'm looking forward to it this year because last year I could only see so many and I'm yeah. looking forward to, to seeing all of them this year because the speakers are just really, really incredible, yeah. wonderful people passionate about gardening and passionate about yeah. teaching 
You know, uh, you got uh, one of the great compliments uh, from, I believe, Susan Harris at Garden Rant, who called this the future of uh, garden presentations or something like that last year. Yeah. Uh, was it her, Was it Susan? Or what, it was one of the garden ranters. I think it was Elizabeth. And was she it, was Elizabeth? saying it was the, okay, maybe she's it was. seen the future of spring garden shows, and it's yeah. called The Great Grow Long. <laughs> Well, and and something we it's something we've learned over the last couple of years. You can you can do that. I mean, yeah, there's still something about uh, being someplace in person and the smells and the uh, feels, the tactile senses uh, uh, of being uh, right in front of a plant. Uh, but um, yeah. you can do a lot online, and um, I'm just amazed that uh, you alluded to the sense that, that people are tired of Zoom. Uh, nobody's tired of Zoom, right? We all love it. <laughs> you um, know, that comment was really interesting <laughs> and eye-opening for us because it is a good point. If you're going to, yeah. like, I was just at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show, for example, and it tends to be, you know, local presenters, which is great because it's very specific to um, gardening in that zone, but with an event like this, you can have people from all over the country. And as you said, you can learn a lot from gardeners in other places, yeah. right? Like you can learn tricks, you can see things that maybe you hadn't grown before. So um, yeah, it was a real eye opener for us that it it is something you wouldn't get all in one place if you just went to a, a live show, which by the way, you know, getting to go to a live show this year was really nice for all the reasons you said, you get to see the garden displays and you get to, you know, see the vendors and that that's really fun. But I don't really see this as a replacement for that. I see this as an add on to that. Well, and, and I saw you nodding there uh, in the preview there, Nicole, uh, about that idea. And, of course, people, when they go to see your presentation or get online to see your presentation, uh, are learning about growing in Texas via uh, Chicago, via the Midwest. I mean, and you, you bring all of that to what you're doing. Yeah, it was, um, you know, when I first started gardening, most of the books I read, well, I have to admit, I don't. I, I'm more of a, I learn by doing. Um, but when I did pick up some books, many of them were written either by UK gardeners, those guys seem yep. to like be pro over there, um, or New England gardeners or California. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would talk about things being perennial in the landscape or easy to grow. And then um, that just wasn't my experience. And as I uh, even set up Ruta Garden in Houston, um, I had gardened previously in Virginia and Tennessee, and it was shocking to me to see the differences uh, in Houston. And, you know, Houston has the same planting zone as much of California. And so I was trying to follow their tips and tricks, but Houston is a, it's a world of its own. <laughs> and so <laughs> it has humidity and flooding and heavy rain that you know most of our friends in California didn't have. And so um, so I realized like this thing is it's so local and the need for each of us to really be led and taught by by someone who's growing in our not just in our zone but in literally our our town, our city, our our zip code, you know. And so as I grew rooted garden, I would get more and more um, questions online. Um, some would say, hey, do you have a rooted garden where I live? I want someone to do what you do here. Um, but I also got lots of requests from gardeners who said, I would love to help people learn how to garden in my own town the way you're doing. Mm -hmm. So that's what sparked the idea for Gardenary. I thought, you know, we have things like Airbnb, right, where people can find the best local place to, um, to rent a house. And I thought, what if we had that for gardeners where people who wanted help could go online and find a gardener who's um, an experienced gardener and a consultant in their town. So um, so we're just getting started. We have 700 consultants who've been through the program so far, but that is what we're talking about. That is really our vision is um, that each of us can get help locally. And uh, looking at this preview of the Great Grow Along, Amanda, oh my goodness, it's like every garden personality that I love online is in this show. I'm like, I didn't realize how many people um, you guys have, have gotten for this event. It's just amazing. And so it's going to be so fun for viewers to get exposure mm -hmm. to um, people who are gardening all over the country and then also doing it in such different ways. Um, I think it's just, um, it opens, all of us, I think, have this predetermined, you know, um, 
I don't know, beliefs about garden, right? Gardening, like either your grandmother had to hand it down to you or you had to be born with it or you have to have this amount of space or this amount of sunlight or um, this amount of money. And it's really neat to, to see such a panel that they've put together because you realize gardening really, that's gardenary. The term is gardening is ordinary. And our vision is there's a garden for everybody, um, no matter where you are, what you have, you know, the time, the space, the experience you have. So um, it's going to be so fun to watch all these presentations and see that actually like played out, you know, how people are are making the garden um, an ordinary part of their lives. It's well, really you know, since you mentioned gardenary and uh, it's a combination of gardens are ordinary, you get this. All right, uh, everybody, every every gardener deserves their own rim shot uh, or a ding. You can get Peggy gave you a ding there, um, and you you're scaring me a little bit because as you were speaking, Nicole, and you said the word sunlight, the sun came out outside uh, from behind a Yay. cloud. I just oh, not it. here. Uh, uh, well, it did. Well, it went away. It's already gone away. It was all of like 10 seconds, but, uh, it was, was the equivalent it, of, oh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's why it scared me. So let's take a walk down alliteration alley, um, and, uh, see the, uh, the events that are going to be at the great grow along. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, Lamanda, because you've got small space Saturday, sustainability Sunday, make it Monday, Transformation Tuesday, Wildlife Wednesday, Tiny Thursday, and Flower Friday. And that's just, and that's, you know, there's, there are more days than that as well, because you've got uh, opening acts and closing acts. And, and the happy um, hour. and the That's right. Um, just grab a, a couple of those topics, Lamanda, like a small space. I think a lot of people who, who watch and listen to this show have small gardens. Um, and we're always jealous. You know, you mentioned Nicole, uh, about picking up a book when I first started, I did the same as you. And, and I, and, and I would pick up these books and they would say, here's how to grow delphiniums. And I went, Oh, I didn't realize delphinium was the Holy grail of gardening. And then I realized no, it's going to die in your yard. And, uh, there's no reason to have a delphinium in your yard. Okay. And, but it took me years to figure that out until I real started looking at what people were doing in my own area. And uh, I would no more have a delphinium in my yard than I would an alligator right now um so uh this uh and so i say in terms of small spaces i think people who watch this are looking for the same thing i am it's like how can i make that work in this tiny space uh lamanda what have you got going well you know last year there were so many new people that started gardening they say between 18 and 20 million people that was part of the reason that we did the great grow along last year and many of those people um, are urban gardeners. And I think often the books and the information that's out there is about people that have a, a landscape where they have a lot of space. You know, I love small space urban gardening because of the Peterson Garden Project and because I'm a, an urban gardener myself. And so uh, we w really wanted to make sure that that information was available to people. So there's actually two small space Saturdays. It's the first Saturday and the second Saturday because there's so much information to be had. And, you know, we really, when we talk with the presenters, we say, listen, we need to make this accessible to people that have never gardened before or have just started gardening. It needs to be what we call zone agnostic because we have people all over the country watching it. And just this situation that we've been talking about, how gardening so different in different parts of the, of the country and the world. And um, we really wanted to just present different ways that people can succeed in um in tiny spaces. So we've got uh, sessions on trellising. We have sessions on growing food in container gardens. We have sessions on three season gardening in small spaces. And it's, it's really exciting, the material that the presenters have put together. And the thing I really love about it is just people sharing their, what they do and sharing it with others. And so that part's really exciting to me. Um, and I'm looking also at Wildlife Wednesday, uh, which is something uh, people want to do as well, as, especially birds and bees. They want to know how to get those in into their garden. So uh, there'll be a focus on that as well. Yeah, we got a lot of feedback last year that that was really important to people. We had a whole track of it last year, and we really wanted to do that again this year. And uh, again, National Wildlife Federation is a sponsor this year, and they're providing uh, some of the speakers. David Mizajewski, who's one of their um, spokespeople, is speaking. 
They also helped us with our um, house plan happy hour person. Deb, Deb Wolf is, uh, is talking that night. So yeah, the Wildlife Wednesday piece is, is really big. Doug Tallamy, who is, I know, a fan of the Mike Novak show. So <laughs> he's going to be there. And it's really exciting. One thing I'd like to also point out is that, um, especially on that day, is we have a new feature this year called Shop the Event, where people can yes. see the books from the speakers, sign up for a course that the speakers have. They can, um, you know, in the, the case the of National Ed, Wildlife Federation, the they have a... Um, a product where you can buy native plants by zip code. So we have that feature mm -hmm. there. So we're trying to make it just all sort of an all encompassing experience for people so they can get everything they need learning wise, you know, education wise, product wise, all in one space. Well, aside from that, which is, which is a cool part of what you're doing, what, uh, and, and make this, uh, just give me a, a quick answer. Cause I want to get to some of what uh, Nicole is doing here. Um, what, what are you proudest of that you've brought to the, uh, great grow along this year? Well, it's an organization, organizational feat to do something like this. Yeah. And I think that it's really going to be valuable to people to connect and learn and make 2022 a hopeful thing. You know, I believe the world's better with more gardeners in it. And I think that, you know, the way things are right now, we all need some hope. And so I, yeah. I feel that that's going to bring a lot of greatness to people, you know, some joy and something to look forward to. Um, and uh, let's make sure folks know that, that uh, to get there, just go to greatgrowalong.com. Um, and if I understand correctly, it's, it's free, except if you want to get uh, um, um, a... Uh, the on-demand. Uh, that's correct if you can participate in the event it's free if you want to see it after the fact it's an it's an on-demand situation right. right and and that's still going to be worth uh the money mm -hmm. um so all right <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean if the, 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 those great people are there preserved for you to to see and then yeah. you can watch it over and over if you don't get it the first time um so let's go to you can i just say something yeah say something real quick about no i didn't get to see like i saw maybe five sessions last year because it was, you know, just layered and layered. And Nicole's was one that I saw and I was so blown away. And I've seen a lot of garden education stuff out there in my day. And I was so blown away about what you're doing and how you're doing it. And I just, I'm glad that you're back this year, but kudos to you and what you're putting together because you're making it available to people. And I think it's really incredible. All right. Well, on that note, let's go to you, Nicole. Uh, explain uh, the gardenery and uh, the, um, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't have it right in front of me, rooted garden, sorry, and uh, the difference between the two. Yeah. So uh, I uh, started rooted garden in 2015. We just celebrated six years back in November. I'm a mom of four and uh, started learning to garden. I grew up, my grandfather was the head of horticulture at Mississippi State University. So I have plants in my, you know, lineage. I think we all do, right? Uh, but I swore that I was going to have a yard of gravel when I grew up. But um, <laughs> when I was doing yard work with my parents, so I was like, I am not going to have anything green to take care of. Uh, but once I was home with my kids, I was really looking for um, the next thing, honestly and trying to kind of find my way in my 30s. So we started gardening. I loved it so much. And um, just, you know, my kids knew if they couldn't find me, um, I was out in the garden. And so in 2015, I thought if there's any way I can turn my love for the garden into a business, I would absolutely, it would be a dream come true. So I sent out a first email and said, you know, I love the people of Houston and I love the gardens and I love to combine those two things and help other people learn how to garden too. So the business grew really quickly. Uh, what we do is we um, meet with clients. We uh, usually are working in a space that doesn't have any kind of, um, you know, organic or food growth. Sometimes they have a garden they want us to redo, but say like in this space, you're getting to see here, this was all just grass and overgrown bushes and and kind of what they call trash trees. I don't know if you're supposed to say that out loud, but uh, um, I do so all the time. Yeah, I call them, I call, <laughs> okay, so I, I call, I call them ju junk permission. trees myself. We, so we come in and we um, and our goal is to make the kitchen garden look like um, it's always been there. So 
We design uh, beautiful raised bed kitchen gardens and then we install them and we even maintain them for our clients. And uh, we use raised beds because uh, most of our clients are starting fresh. They've usually never gardened before. And we've really learned over the years that um, there's three keys to success, especially for a new gardener. And that is great setup, good timing and consistency. And so our goal is to really do all the heavy lifting part of the installation for the client and then to teach them what grows when. And that's what my class is with the Great Grow Along this season is I'll be teaching gardeners everywhere how to really understand their own unique seasons. And uh, in Houston, we call it the nonstop garden because we do have four seasons. Uh, everyone actually does, um, but ours are um, warmer. Usually most of the year we're above um, freezing, which is amazing. And so we teach our clients what to grow when, we help them plant those things. And then, um, and then we help them be consistent. So we do coaching sessions with clients and then we even have a maintenance service. So, uh, so that's Rooted Garden. And what happened, as I mentioned before, is uh, I shared all this, these things I was doing on this little app. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called Instagram. It's kind of, <laughs> people like it. So, um, so I was just on the go, honestly, as a mom of four and working in all these gardens. And uh, I was just taking pictures, taking videos and sharing my work on Instagram and realized that, you know, this is something that other gardeners around the country could do as well. Um, it was just so amazing to get to take my love for the garden and turn it into a profession, um, you know, something that sends my kids to soccer and helps buy their clothes and shoes for the school season and, um, you know, just things that support my own family and support our local mm -hmm. economy. In the meanwhile, you know, bringing gardens like this to our town. So in 2017, I launched Gardenary. And uh, I already told you what that means. Gardens are ordinary. So um, our thought here, um, my thought with starting this business is that it would be um, a way to reach a broader audience, people outside of just Houston. And so uh, Gardenary has um, really three uh, aspects. One is we do online education, very similar to what LaManda has created with this great Grow Along event, which is so amazing. So we do um, lots of online courses. We have courses on creating the kitchen gardens like you just saw there, um, indoor seed starting, microgreens, herb gardening, salad gardening, and all those garden courses are held inside of a membership that we call Gardenary 365 uh, because our vision is that all of us should be touching a little piece of the garden every day of the year, even if we're in a cold place. Um, and uh, so we have a membership called Gardenary 365, and then we have our certification for gardeners. So we're actually just about to embark this coming week on Garden Coach Business Week, and we help gardeners start to take that first step to consider if entrepreneurship and small business is something that they would like to do. And so huh. we, um, we certify gardeners. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm just saying, uh, huh, because, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, it's, not, it's more than just gardening. It's, uh, can you take it to the next level? Do you want to take mm -hmm. it to the next level yes. and, and help others? And, and that's pretty cool. It is. It's like, like what Lamanda has pulled together, you know, what she's got this genius of saying, like, all these people have something to teach and, and they all have an audience that wants to learn from them. And so it's kind of that same idea we've done with Gardenary is um, I truly believe like I used to work in philanthropy my first 10 years of my career and uh, we worked with overseas development. And I saw that true change in a society and a culture, it has to be linked to the economy. And, you know, you have to have some way that people can grow professionally in that industry in order for the industry to thrive. And so as I started Rooted Garden, I was like, what if more people could actually earn a living as a gardener? Um, the minute you can tie economic growth to good societal change, you can change a culture. And so, um, so it's, you know, it's, it's slowly taking shape. We have, I've trained uh, 700 gardeners, as I said, so far, we have about 200 certified consultants. So those can be found um, what, what, what is, what's the difference territory. when you say certified? Do you certify yes, them? So gone, yes, we do. So they go through the whole training based on what I do with Ruta Garden. They go through the, all the steps that um, to set up their business, to be legal, to be insured, 
and then to, um, to be able to bring consulting to their local area. And then our goal is that someone, you know, who's local to them can go on the Gardnery site and, uh, and find someone that can help them locally. Mm -hmm. So I just met with a, a gardener in Tennessee, a consultant, and she said 80% of her business comes from the Gardnery site. So that really is our vision is that, um, you know, we're busy with plants, right? So we don't need to be spending all of our time marketing and trying to find clients. So our goal at Gardnery is to do that. Okay. And then the final piece, we do design online. So some of those consultants actually come and work for Gardnery and we just launched an online garden design service. So people who maybe don't have a consultant in their area yet can get a design uh, through us. So we're, um, we're touching, we're trying to touch all the different places and ways to help people, whether they want to DIY and just get some help, you know, in a course or in our membership, mm -hmm. all the way to somebody who wants, you know, someone like Rooted Garden to come in and just do the whole thing for them. Fantastic. All right. And of course, your presentation is on the second Small Space Saturday, Small Space Saturday 2, on Saturday, yes. March, ni March 19th. Um, and uh, to find out all of this, you know, just go to greatgrowalong.com and they've got the agenda there and, and you'll find something that you want to do. Uh, Lamanda, congratulations on year two. Um, and I uh, hope there are many, many more. Um, and I see uh, very quickly because we got we're way over time. Um, I see the Peterson uh, Garden Project is gearing up again this year, which is very cool. Uh, and I take it there are spaces available. Yes, there are some a few spaces available. Not many. Several of the gardens are full, but there are a few few places. So and that's, there, uh, yeah. the seed swap is is this Saturday, this coming Saturday, the twelfth at the Chicago Market. Ah, I'm glad you brought that up too. And um, and I think Sarah Batka from Illinois Extension posted something. She posted a, a, a house plant swap. Uh, there's a plant swap tonight. So yeah. lots going on. This yeah. is the time of year. So Lamanda Joy and Nicole Burke, thank you so much uh, both uh, for being with us and have fun at the, the great grow along. And, and I hope uh, uh, lots of folks uh, sign up. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We hope you can thank join you us. Thank you, Lamanda, for inviting me. All right, you guys take Bye, care. Nicole. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Much more to come. Please stick around. Hey, it's my favorite entomologist, Dr. Riley. How are you doing today? Hey, Victor. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Pretty good. Hey, I was out here the other day, and it was snowing about 20 degrees. It was freezing cold. And underneath this rock, I found what appears to be a perfectly live adult cricket. And it just got me to thinking, how do some insects make it through the cold winter months? Yeah, it's a great question, Victor. So we use the term overwintering to describe how insects navigate the challenges of winter months and successfully make it out on the other side. And generally speaking, when we talk about insects overwintering, there's two different approaches. So the first approach is what we might consider get out of dodge. And monarch butterflies are a great example of this for how they'll travel thousands of miles to Mexico to try to escape the cold winter months. That sounds great. I don't think this cricket's going to hop its way all the way down to Mexico. So what about the insects that stick around? Yeah, so for the ones that stick around, many are going to try to find shelter in some type of protected environment. Areas like leaf litter, the upper few inches of soil, or even inside of man-made structures. Like our attics or sheds or something like that? Yep, exactly. Plenty of insects will try to creep their way inside any type of warm, insulated structure as it gets into the colder months. So another example of an insect that has kind of a unique approach to overwintering would be the boxwood leaf miner. In this case, boxwood leaf miners overwinter in their larval stage, and they actually spend the entire winter season protected within the confines of individual boxwood leaves. Interesting. So shelter sounds great, but does anything physiological happen to insects that help them out? Yeah, shelter is great, but insects can still be exposed to lethal freezing temperatures and have strategies to try to alter their physiology to either avoid freezing or resist freezing. So some will produce substances that are similar to antifreeze, while others will produce waxy protective coatings and cover themselves with it. 
With these different strategies, lots of insects can tolerate the cold winters of temperate ecosystems. So there's a whole lot of insect life here in this winter landscape, more than people may realize, but not a whole lot of activity in this season though, right? Yeah, yeah, great observation, but this is actually a great time to have an arborist on site. Uh, a trained arborist can help survey plant material, observe signs and symptoms of insect activity from earlier in the year, and begin to help you develop a strategy to try to care for and maintain your plants. Wow, very interesting. Hey, Dr. Riley, I want to thank you for your time. And uh, as always, thanks for being a resource for our arborists here at Bartlett Tree Experts. Yeah, my pleasure, Victor. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a soup song of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music, porches, lawn serene. Give me all that I can take. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Um, yeah, that, that Bartlett, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I was going to say that Bartlett spot, very interesting with the um, the cricket living under the, the leaf litter. I don't know if what your yard looked like yesterday, but I was seeing a lot of insects out. Really? Including some uh, walks. Well, I mm-hmm. I almost didn't get out You're at all. You're going to be in for yesterday. a big surprise. But. Yeah, you know, the, the problem with, with me is uh, Saturdays are not my own. Uh, as I'm putting, How could you miss a 65-degree day to even step out in the yard for five minutes, though? I did. How, how do you like them apples? Um, so, uh, although I did, uh, I did chase a squirrel uh, away from the suet feeder, and, and after a while... Bird he, feeders, yeah. Uh, yeah, he just, uh, it, I mean, he was hanging upside. See, I've been working on thwarting the squirrel all week because he kept knocking the feeder to the ground. And then he would pounce on it. And and and, and the birds liked it too because it gave them more access to it on the ground as well. And, uh, uh, but I said, no, 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 no. You, you don't get to knock that to the ground. So I, I, I managed to find a way to, to crimp the hook on the branch mm-hmm. so now the squirrel just has to hang upside down and 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 for most of the time i say okay have have some of the suet you're not getting very much of it out of there anyway uh but every now and then i'll, I'll walk out and say hey come on get out of here and after a while the squirrel will go up to a little part of the tree and just look at me and go i'm just gonna wait till you go away you know because it wasn't then gonna start barking at you yeah well no it didn't even bark at me this one just kind of sat there just looking at me yeah. kind of like this and okay what was it you're saying yeah. i can't hear you la 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 uh and <laughs> and then it would oh, come, hey, hey, it's that guy again yeah yeah you know <laughs> it doesn't work so uh i guess i've sort of learned to live with the squirrel getting a little bit of the suet uh which is fine whatever but look uh, at all the, the birds you now have in your yard that that you didn't have last year uh i do have some more and i have to tell you um my friend mac introduced me to this app which is the um merlin from cornell lab Mm -hmm. cornell university uh and it uh, you can do sound id so i've been trying the Mm -hmm. sound id in my backyard and here are the species that i've gotten uh in the backyard in the last week um northern cardinal purple finch dark-eyed junco gray catbird uh, who knew? House sparrow, mm-hmm. of course. Uh, Lapland long spur. Now, Kathleen claims she saw a Lapland long spur. I have not seen anything like that. Um, and uh, of course, robins. Of course, my uh, I've, I've seen both. I've seen the male and female yeah. of the downy woodpeckers because uh, the yeah. male apparently has the red on the back and the female does not. So I've seen that those, and uh, what probably am I probably have goldfinch. I've heard goldfinch in your neighborhood before. I've seen goldfinch in in my yard. Okay. I haven't gotten it on the uh, on this yet. So there's there's a number of uh, species mm-hmm. even in smack dab in the middle of the city here. Yeah. 
Um, and the red, as I commented last week, the red wing blackbirds are back. And um, of course, pigeons. <laughs> pigeons. Pigeons. I get lots pigeons. of pigeons, uh, especially on the bird feeder out front. And then I just knock on the window because I love to see them go <laughs> and, and just yeah. fly They're off. squeaky birds. Yeah. Squeaky birds. Yeah. Um, morning doves. Squeaky birds. So oh, I, had, I, it, I know they're morning during, doves as um, well. I haven't seen any this year yet, though. Yeah. Well, we had the snow the other day. I looked out at the bird feeder because I have um, a heat. I've got the little immersion heater in the bird feeder. And there were not one, but two flickers, which are a type of woodpecker, sitting on the bird bath. Mm. I, 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 I've never seen woodpeckers sitting on a bird bath. And there were two of them. I was like, wow. By the time I went and got the cell phone, there was only one. But it's like, wow, I've never uh, seen that. Um, and and um, our, our frustrated atheist uh, here on the chat says, love downy woodpeckers. Well, it was funny because I saw them both in the yard at the same time, which I had never seen before. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I was on the phone to you at the time and I was, yeah. I, we were talking and, and uh, uh, the, the female went after the sparrows. It was hilarious. Uh, she wanted, <laughs> she wanted to get to the suet and she was not going to let any sparrows on while, and she was chasing them. And the male was just kind of up there in the, in the snag going, yeah, whatever, you know, I'll wait till she's done and then we'll, we'll get out of here. Uh, so it was, it, it was kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, As I was commenting to you yesterday while we were on the phone too, the Sand Hill cranes are starting to get on the move. I saw 40 going right. overhead yesterday and I've, I've uh, seen other people posting on Facebook, 150 of this, this. So there's, they're, they're not migrating per se yet, but they're starting to move back and forth. Okay. Well, we have a, like too much stuff here and not enough time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were already down to 15. What do we have to get to? Bell bowl. Let's uh, start with bell bowl. Okay. I was going to, st- all right, let, we'll good start news. with that. And, <laughs> and um, go we ahead. Started good news. You you go ahead and uh, and report um, on Bell Bowl. This it, it's uh, I lost the articles, but there's oh. there's been a bit of a reprieve, as it were. Yeah. Um, a temporary reprieve, Bell Bowl reprieve of when the bulldozers are potentially rolling has now been extended to June first. Uh, as uh, Patty Wetley says, now what? in her WTTW article from this week. Right. And um, all of these are uh, uh, at my blog post, Mike Novak. Yeah. So uh, you yeah. can read about it. Um, and, yeah, so and- we've been talking about Bell Bowl for months and the Prairie Watchdogs were camped out Monday night because March 1st had been the, the threatened deadline of when they might roll the bulldozers. And um, it's been pushed off until the summer, at least June 1st. And I'm looking for the, the um, exact what's next, but they're looking to see what's what's happening with an FAA review um, and the well, biological says, assessment. A spokesperson for the FAA told WTTW News that airport officials had committed to halting construction. Yeah, they're 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 still going through this process. FAA has to weigh in it. The uh, Endangered Species Act plays uh, into this because of the rusty patch bumblebee, which is found on site. Mm-hmm. I frankly, if they find it again, I don't know how they could possibly plow that area. Yeah. Uh, bull- bulldoze the area. So, you know, I think that's what the net, the question becomes who will have access to even look for that? Let's not yeah. forget that they did a study. Okay. Air quotes, a study a couple of years ago. And they said, there's nothing of uh, importance here. Let's uh, let's, let's do the yeah. plan. Um, and then of yeah. course, this past year, um, uh, the folks from Natural Land Institute went on there, and the first thing, the first thing they found was the rusty patch bumblebee. Yeah, and, hey, and, look, yeah, yeah, really. Um, yeah. And, and so, and, and, and things like the penstemon, it's too early; it's not blooming in May. I would guess some of the rare. Per- that, well, that's what I'm wondering are. too. Is yeah, when do you? When's the proper time to to look for this? Um, and uh, you know, who is going to be allowed to do that since? Uh, the Natural Land Institute is in a court battle with the the, the airport. Um, I got a feeling they're not going to be allowed on there, even though they have been stewards of that land for decades. So now they're shut out there, you know, but who yeah. it'll be interesting to see who they let on the land and how accurate they will be in finding species uh, there. Yeah. So, so I'd say um, stay tuned. 
Make sure you're on savebellbowprairie.org. Join the Facebook group and keep up with what's going on. And I got, and I just got to say again, uh, uh, in in the article and other people, you know, uh, and if you go to Save Bellbow Prairie on Facebook, it's constant, constant comments on there about all kinds of things. Um, and there, there's been pressure uh, on on Governor J.B. Pritzker, uh, Senator Dick Durbin, Senator Tammy Duckworth, and I have to say that their response. I got one of the uh, the canned responses, the form, letters. form letters from uh, Tammy Duckworth. Uh, their response is so tepid right now. It's 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 really frustrating. It's you know the politicians right now are just well we'll see we 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 hope everybody works together well except that the airport won't talk to anybody right now so you know i don't know if that's going to happen so it's keep, it's beyond it's beyond la 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 from the airport yeah, it's just it, it's mind boggling it, it really is all right so that's that uh the other thing is uh we got a um uh an email from a friend of ours john lee and his you might remember uh, folks probably don't. I <laughs> I barely remember myself because uh, we have. Uh, well, uh, that 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 goes back to you know pre-COVID days when we were in an actual radio studio. Right, and he came in um, to talk about climate change and legal issues with Rick Tamayo. We had a wonderful conversation that the day he came in, and he has. Yeah, so, okay. You've got to remember it. That was the day Rick came and he had all of these wonderful baked items he had brought, all the baked goods. I wish he'd bring them now. Uh, that would be really good. Uh, <laughs> but there's an Interfaith Climate Summit next Sunday, the 13th at 3 o'clock p.m. at Lincoln Park Presbyterian Church. That's 600 West Fullerton Parkway, but it's also online, uh, just so you know. And uh, I've got the link uh, there. And uh, what uh, John, John's uh, participating in it, he says um, he, he expects the format to be the event will start with a brief introduction of the participants, uh, giving an overview of what we would like to accomplish. And uh, it's bringing people of all different kind, uh, different faiths together to talk about how they can affect action. Eastern and Western faiths. Uh, I'm sorry? Eastern and Western faiths. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's quite the mix. Yeah, right. Um, so they've yeah they've got uh, Buddhist, Catholic, Sikh, uh, Baha'i, Jewish, Protestant, uh, all all in the same room uh, to talk about this. So if uh, if you want to participate in the Interfaith Climate Summit next Sunday, uh, again it's at three p.m. at Lincoln Park Presbyterian Church, or you can go online and and, and I, as I said, I've got the link. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I'll just on, put that in the chat too. Yeah, and and we're going to get John on the show again to talk legal issues. Uh, and bring him in again with Rick, and we'll just put them on both on the screen here. They won't be next to each other to, the way they were in the studio, but uh, I definitely, definitely uh, want to talk about that. Um, then there's something you sent me about uh, the war in Europe. The war in Europe's breadbasket reverberates in an unlikely place. Before we get to that. I mean, this is precipitated. Yeah, we got two events. We got to make sure we oh, cover right, two. Right, right, right. Okay, let's get to the events, and we'll get back to the, to the war. Oh boy, the <laughs> the war in Europe. Wow, yes. is this is it 1939 or what? Okay, um, uh, and the, the two, of course, the One Earth Film Festival. You saw a trailer of that on the show mm -hmm. already this morning. It's now. It's running now through March 13th. Go to oneearthfilmfest.org and you can see the whole agenda there um we're we're proud to be a sponsor their their slogan this year is turn the tide um and i see uh, when i go to the spot the uh, uh, film exposure is the first one that pops up uh, which is the trailer we showed today so we hope you take advantage of that it's free but there is a suggested mm -hmm. donation um and we hope you uh support them uh and it's, i was looking at last week's show and i said come on folks you're americans pony up um and, and honest to goodness it's it's the way i feel about it uh so there's that which is through the 13th through next sunday and then there's the uh one day only the evanston environmental Asso environmental association 
Wild and Scenic Film Festival. That is uh, March 11th. Uh, we have mm-hmm. the, the link to that up there. Yeah, um, that's in, in person and virtual as well. And that actually does have a, uh, a ticket price. It's uh, $10 for single, both yeah. in person and virtual, $18 for a family or group. Um, and 25 bucks for an eco champion, a family group, virtual event ticket, plus a small donation to the, come on, you know, if you go to a regular theater, you're going to pay, you're going to pay a lot Mm -hmm. more than 25 bucks to watch a film in America now. Uh, so you might as well. And that money's not going to help anything. Um, right. Unlike this is going to help environment environmental association. It's going to buy more popcorn and cherry Coke, but, uh, maybe that that's it. So, um. The uh, that's this uh, fr- uh, the 11th is Friday, right? Yeah, it's Friday. Uh, mm-hmm. this Friday, so uh, we hope you uh, take advantage of that. Now, let's get back to the uh, story that you sent me. Um, and that was uh, and and and, and it started a conversation. Uh, Peggy and I had a, a little bit of a conversation, and we realized that in some ways, uh, it's like two years ago, it's like two years ago all over again. Um, and that is to say, when the pandemic start started, people hunkered down. They began to understand the importance of of growing their own food, gardening, uh, you know, food security, making their own yogurt, which we're still doing here. So, uh, and and baking their own bread, which we're still doing here. Um, and it's and in and, so- and, and, and the importance of food security. Yeah. Uh, because it, when people don't have any kind of security, as they don't in Ukraine right now, and and the people in Russia are going to start to suffer because of the sanctions. So we got millions and millions of people without that kind of security, uh, and um, it makes us think that you know maybe it's smart to garden in, in the backyard and to grow some of your own stuff as much of it as you can. And I think you're right, Peggy, that we've kind of We've looped around back to 2020, even though the pandemic is easing. Knock on wood, ding it. Um, and 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 I think you're right that people will start thinking about this again. Yeah, um, the importance of community gardening, the importance of supporting organics, which is one of the things that the the Forbes article that you have linked, which unfortunately I can't open because I'm getting a weird paywall thing that I shouldn't be seeing, but I'm getting it. Um, The article's talking about inflation, um, the cost of food. It's looking at things like, as as this war continues, you know, shipments, oil prices going up, everything, inflation, um, the fear that, uh, in this case, it's pointing to chicken, the chicken industry, that farmers who may have been doing organic chickens or free range, et cetera, may go more to conventional to save on expenses. But it also starts raising the question about um, organic farming and the importance of supporting local organic farmers and keeping keeping them going right now, as opposed to just going, okay, well, you know, organics are too expensive, et cetera. And the fear that some of them either can't stay in business or your bigger organic farms will go back towards conventional. It's it's a scary trend. Yeah, and, and of course, this uh, just is the tip of the iceberg in terms of environmental impacts Mm -hmm. of uh, the war. Um, There's an article we also have linked from Inside Climate News. Uh, Activists deplore the human toll and environmental devastation from Russia's unprovoked war of aggression in Ukraine. And make no mistake, it is unprovoked. Um, the, the subhead, the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court opening an investigation into alleged war crimes has authority to bring charges for damage to the environment that is widespread, long-term, and severe. And you know there's going to be all kinds of things. Um, oh, yeah. imp- uh, release of toxic materials into air, water, and soil. Uh, from crumpled buildings, impaired sanitation systems, exploded pipelines, damaged industrial facilities, fuel and chemical Pol- storage water sites. Um, these uh, experts fear that the fighting could escalate with Russia targeting Ukraine's hydroelectric dams, toxic mm-hmm. mine tailing dams. That's not good. And hazardous weight, uh, waste storage sites. So yeah. we've just begun. And, and then the, 
Yeah. And then the ongoing effects is, as you're, I'm, I'm sure many, many of our viewers have read of looking to, well, do we open up domestic drilling again? Do we start putting well, out yeah, leases? We chatted about that on the show before, and you know that we're going to go yeah. down because we, that's, there, there are people going to say, well, it's the only way we can get through this is that we just have to drill more. And, um, you know, it, it shows our lack of imagination for one and the lack of preparedness for something like yeah. this. And, um, yeah. I, I am sure on, on your bingo card, you didn't have Putin invades Ukraine for 2022. Most people did not. Uh, so finally, um, yeah. Let's uh, get to something positive well, what, here. Yeah, what? happy note here of something. Well, uh, there's uh, no, well, we do have Soil Health Week. That's that's the the, the happy note that I. Um, yeah, as opposed to the Yellowstone story. No, that's just we don't want to. You can about click that. onto the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. We have that uh, information there, and if if you don't go to uh, our blog, you can go to ilstewards.org, and they're having Soil Health Week 2022. Um, March 7th through 11th. And there are, it's, you know, it's like the, uh, the great grow along. There's all kinds mm -hmm. of events. This is happens to be particularly focused on soil. Um, and there are presentations every day, um, uh, farmers and, uh, and the, the Rick Clark on Monday, a, a fifth generation organic and regenerative farmer from, uh, Indiana. Uh, we've got a soil health summit on Wednesday, uh, a keynote on uh, Wednesday as well. Um, more, back to regenerative agriculture and human health on Thursday. Yeah. Um, soil health in the city for those of you who live in urban and suburban areas. That's uh, on Friday. Um, so this is something that uh, is very cool, and I've I've signed up for it, and I know Peggy has yeah. as well. And, and I would say, you know. When I sometimes when I mention an event like this to people, it's it's oh well you know I I don't live in the country I'm not a farmer I live in the city it you know I'm not saying this about necessarily anybody who's watching the show just general conversations as it but it all ties together and the more you know about it the greater the understanding of it the easier it is to fill in the dots and and to educate people. So if you get a chance, uh, click on. You don't have to go to all of them. Stop in. And, and and see what's happening. Um, I think uh, you will yeah. find or Maybe it. that's connect the dots. I said fill in the dots. Connect the dots. <laughs> <laughs> I like fill in the dots. Unless well, it's not standardized tests. Where that's what I was going to say. Unless it's the SAT, uh, in which case you're, uh, you're filling in the dots. And, and, and it just reminded me of one more uh, that I got to get to here uh, before we break. Oh, come on, Michael. You can find it. You can find it. It's here. Where are you? There we go. Um, speaking, oh no, where is it? Ah, hate that. Uh, cause there's a seminar coming up. Talk amongst yourselves, folks. Uh, <laughs> oh. uh, here we go. It is a battery recycling webinar. And this has been one of my pet peeves for a long oh. time. It's being hosted by the Illinois Recycling Foundation. Full uh, disclosure, I am a board member of the Illinois Recycling Foundation. Thank you for the ding. I, I deserve a punch, I think, for that one. Um, and and Wait, uh, aren't I supposed to be poking you to wake you up right now? Uh, yeah, you are, because I, I have not had any sleep this night, last <laughs> night. Um, and it's uh, on the March 16th, which is uh, Wednesday. It's about recycling batteries. Uh, everything you need to know. Um, and you can go to IllinoisRecycles.org. Um, if you're a member and you should sign up and be a member, if you can, it's not that much for an individual. Um, it's free, but non-members, it's $50. Uh, but it's certainly something I'm going to be paying attention to. I think, um, I, I don't know why we make billions and billions and billions, billions and billions, a little blue spot, um, billions and billions of batteries. And then we just throw them away. Throw them in the landfill. That can't yep. be good. I don't know. I'm just thinking here. What, what, what do I know about anything? All right. Steve, can I do a quick product placement before the break? Product placement. Product placement. Um, all right. You got to say something about it. You oh, gotta, this, um, the March issue, the um, plant-based foods, speaking 
of oh. Natural Awakening Chicago. Thank you. NACHicago.com. Thank you to everyone who signed up for the newsletter last week. If you haven't, please go to NACHicago.com and click subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. All right. There you go. All right. Time to get uh, some uh, weather and uh, climate information. Meteorologist Rick DeMaio is... From spring seed and soil treatments to summer foliar feeding to fall stubble digesters, Blazing Star provides microbial tools from tiny biologicals for natural and organic farmers. They have solutions for home gardeners too. And Blazing Star also offers agroecological education and consulting, especially for permaculture work in zones four and five. Learn more about these great folks and great techniques at blazing-star.com. So this is a very simple PAR meter, and I'm going to measure the PAR value of this fluorescent light, which was purchased at a Home Depot specifically for growing um, and advertised as a seed starting light. Minimally for PAR value for just seed starting, so just to the seedling stage, you want a minimum of 80, really. Um, 75 to 100 will do the trick. I would say 100 to 150 is far better. Um, but right now, at about a foot above the plants, uh, we're getting 49. So now we're going to, let me plug in our happy leaf light. This is our 17 inch Procyon 2.0. Um, and it's a really great all around light. Um, they also come in 33 inch lights, which I have set up here, which is where I'm going to actually put my seed flat. Let's get it about a foot over. I'm getting a value of 335. Early in the COVID pandemic, many lives were lost and there wasn't much we could do. Now there's effective vaccines and boosters, but some people choose not to take a shot. Some say they don't know what the vaccine will do, but we all know what COVID has already done. Now we all have a choice to make. Let's make a choice we can live with. For information on how to find a COVID-19 vaccine or booster near you, visit vaccines.gov. And welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. There he is, meteorologist Rick DeMaio. Good morning. Happy Sunday. Happy windy Sunday to you. Wow, what is uh, <laughs> some interesting stuff going on last night. <laughs> Um, yeah, and it depends on, you know, where do you want to talk about it? Parts of Iowa, yeah. here, north of Illinois. Yeah. Tornadoes, um, wind damage. Yeah, uh, they just um, mentioned this morning on the National Weather Service site out in Des Moines, Iowa, that uh, the tornado that went through Madison County, um, Winterset is the town that got hit hardest. Uh, the death toll is now up to seven. Uh, that's the worst wow. outbreak. Yeah, the worst outbreak since 2008. Um, and you know, I'm watching this tornado move through, and you know, it had the classic wedge shape. There was a couple of times where it had, um, you know, multiple vortices. Uh, it was easily um, high end F3, maybe even a low end F4. Um, and as the case when you get a tornado uh, in an event like this, it's usually associated with the very deep. Uh, mid-latitude cyclone where the winds are very, very strong. So the tornado basically uh, is by itself. Um, anytime I tell people when you're looking at the radar and you're looking at a cell that is on the south edge of a small line, usually that's the one that's probably going to go tornadic. Uh, kind of like what the Fairdale, Illinois tornado did here back in uh, 2014, I think it was. Um, it was on the ground for almost almost an hour and a half. Um, and because the farmland uh, this time of the year is just basically all mud, uh, it gets that very dark look. So when you get one tornado with white clouds in the background and a dark looking uh, funnel in the foreground, it's uh, extremely photogenic. And that tornado mm -hmm. uh, had literally circulated across Twitter world yesterday um, in a matter of minutes. Uh, fortunately, the system um, kind of weakened a little bit before it moved into um, Illinois, but we had two different rounds of weather. Uh, the yeah. first one came between about 7.30 and 8, dropped a couple of 
uh, about a half inch or so of heavy rain in some spots. And then um, that second line formed on the cold front and actually outraced the front. Uh, was moving at about 60 miles an hour, and that came through between about 11 and about midnight, and the front came through about 3 a.m. So we had wind reports. I just sent you guys over some new stuff that just came across the weather wire about a half hour ago. Um, 70 mile an hour winds at Rockford uh, at around DeKalb, yeah. Actually, 65 says, uh, below that. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing here in weather.gov, 81 mile per hour gust observed at Rockford Airport even. Yeah, yeah, I think I think yeah. I saw in the uh, observation like in. seventy five. Yeah. yeah, like yeah, like seventy five knots, uh, which is you know category one um, hurricane force winds or you know F F zero to F one tornado winds. Um, but those were straight line winds. So when you get storms moving that fast and they lose their ability to generate you know rotation at the surface, you generally tend to go from the possibility of tornadoes to just straight line winds. Um, yeah. I took my dog out yeah, to early. At hail. Yeah, I'm seeing hail yeah. in Batavia. Uh, 71 yeah, miles per hour at Page Airport, 60 in Antioch. Wow. This this is on weather.gov. Yeah, that, yep, yep, yeah, off the um off the Nash Weather Service site. Um hail was was probably the more um limited element of this. Uh but I just saw a tree down the block from me, about a 20-foot tall wow. tree, uh blown over. I mean, literally uprooted. And that's wow. kind of rare for the, the year because the ground is really hard. Uh, but we did get, you know, some warming over the last couple of days. I actually took that walk this morning to see the snow pile that was there yesterday. It's gone now. And then the mm. crocuses that were coming up yesterday morning bloomed out. I mean, what? the crocuses. Yeah. I'll, I'll go back I, and take pictures. I mean, my snowdrops are just starting right now. Yeah, I, I, I have some pictures of aconites blooming in people's yards. Well, maybe maybe those maybe those are snowdrops and not crocuses. It um, could be. Well, what was what was interesting? I was watching this this band of storms, the second band approaching, and as it got really close, it almost had that freight train sound. The wind oh, yeah. was so yeah. heavy outside. I, I had to open the door. I'm like, it, it, what what am I hearing? It was it was a freight yeah, train wind, sound. Yeah, the wind was incredibly loud last night. But I'll go back and uh, take the um, uh, take the picture of those snowdrops, uh, which will then be covered up with snow by this time tomorrow. <laughs> so yeah, we go from uh, we go from sixty nine degrees on the you know what is it the the fifth of March to you know thirty five to forty degrees on the sixth of March and two to four inches of snow, maybe even more on the 7th of March. And, you know, that's happened before. We've seen these type of events. Um, and by this time next week, even by this time, um, by, by this Friday, uh, we're going to have overnight lows in the single digits and highs in the lower 20s. It's going to get really, really la, cold. La, 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 yeah, la, yeah, la, really. La, 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 la. Uh, it, it is March. <laughs> However, I, I just managed to load some of those uh, images uh, that you sent me here. And these are, it's hard hard to see, but there's, these are some of the wind get, gust, right? But you can see yeah. by the number. Look at, the rows. Wow. Look, at, look at that row up there right along I-94, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, I, well, I, the, I made like sure. The wind went in here, it was sure. unbelievable. What's that, Peg? When the, even when the wind slammed in here, it was just, like I said, it was roaring like a freight train outside. Yeah, it, it, was, it was really loud. So um, you can see that the, that the storm that went or the tornado that went just south of Des Moines uh, was a supercell. And you can always tell supercells by the fact that um, you'll see a, you know, basically a line of damage, yeah. um, those red dots south of Des Moines. And the only good thing about that tornado was that it was about – five to eight miles south of downtown Des Moines. Otherwise, I think you would be looking at, you know, probably uh, 30 to 40 people killed with that particular tornado. Now, the other good thing that had happened in the middle of the day, it was on a Saturday, everybody knew about it. Storm Prediction Center outlined that area for a slight risk yesterday. Uh, they upgraded the potential to an enhanced risk, uh, which is a level three. After that, you have moderate and then you have high. Uh, but they had a they had enhanced risk out early Saturday morning. They had watches out. They had warnings out. So, from a standpoint of getting people knowledgeable about the uh, particular event, um, 
all the information was there. And again, I mentioned this so many times, um, the, the actual event occurring in the middle of the day on a Saturday uh, is monumental from people being able to know about it. But you take the same tornado, which was a wedge that said you can't see at 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night, um, and you bring it through – uh, you bring it through the Des Moines area, and I'm telling you, the, the, the death toll would have been four or five times higher. So, uh, unfortunately, seven people lost their lives. And what's really sad, Mike and Peg, is, you know, two of them were kids. They were children, wow. you know, and, and you know that that was probably a situation where the parents probably did whatever they can to huddle um, in a house, and maybe the house wasn't strong enough. So whenever I hear children being killed, you know, within a tornado, um, it was probably because they didn't have a place uh, to go. Uh, so when that line moved across the Mississippi River, this was the watch that was issued for us. Um, I'm not sure if they it reissued a, a severe thunderstorm watch further east. I think they probably did because we had severe weather, obviously, here in the city. Oh, yeah, but those the severe initial... thunderstorm warnings. Yeah, severe thunderstorm yeah, warnings were issued. Right. I'm, I'm wondering, though, if they reissued the watch. I didn't go back and look last night. But what's interesting is you notice the eastern edge of that watch goes to 2 a.m. The storms rolled through here at 11 p.m. So yeah. it even mm. moved faster than what than what the storm prediction center was showing because they were they were talking about you know movement of 50 miles an hour. This mm. stuff was moving at 65 to 70. Now, I mean it was. Did this stuff dissipate over the lake or did it slam? I'm sorry, Rick. Sorry. Did it dissipate no, 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 over the lake okay. or did it climb into um, into the counties on the you other side? What? I I did not look, but I wouldn't be surprised that these storms this time of the year, as long as you know, if they move over the lake this time of the year with that lake water being only thirty two degrees, it doesn't take more than about a half hour for that line to completely lose itself. Granted, you'll probably still get you know some amount of downward flowing air from the thunderstorm as it's weakening. And moving through the atmosphere and we always talk about the cooler it is at the surface the quicker those rushes of air can make it through the surface and then the frictionless surface also allows it to move off to the east but this was the actual line um, over Iowa um, just before the tornado um, hit uh, parts of the Des Moines area so this was about as classic of a setup as you can get um, in addition to that uh, they had four to five, six inches of snow up across northern, Mini northern Minnesota, uh, parts of northern uh, Michigan, the upper, the real far northern parts of Wisconsin, uh, where it was basically just They're freezing rain. Across Iowa. Now, officials say this. I, I, I happened to track this uh, down just now, and I hadn't seen yeah, the, the video. It's uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, wow. that, this is, this was every, every bit of. Of, of, a, of a wedge tornado as you would get in, you know, Oklahoma or Texas or Kansas. I mean, it, yeah. it really was amazing. Um, now, granted, you know, they talked about the severe thunderstorms moving into Chicago, and that's always going to get more people to watch at that particular time. So, um, yeah, just, you know, an incredible storm. And you, you can see this coming three days ago. It had everything working for it except moisture. It was not looking that good about two days ago hmm. uh, for deep moisture because if you really look at the overall precipitation pattern, there wasn't a lot. Uh, but sometimes when you have you know very small areas of thunderstorms, uh, they become much more dynamic as opposed to kind of wrapped up in the rain. So um, yeah, we, here here it was you know Illinois severe weather preparedness week, and uh, what we get, <laughs> we got severe weather. Well, and, and here's some of the other stuff that uh, you just sent me. Is this what we're, we're looking at uh, coming our way? Yeah, uh, this is going to be um, about 2 a.m. This is off of one of the forecast models, which has been um, very, very consistent. Um, these, are, these, are, these have been two well-defined waves in the atmosphere. The first one, you know, moving on the northern edge of the jet stream. The second one kind of taking a little bit more of a southern edge. And was really remarkable was within two or three hours after the tornadoes uh, moved through Des Moines and then the cold front came through, they won from 70 degrees. And while it was a tornado warning um, in Des Moines, it was 32 degrees in Sioux City. <laughs> so the, the cold air was, was not far behind. 
And clearly, as you can see, um, we're not going to get out of the 30s today. It looked like a couple of days ago we may take a run at, you know, 40 to 45 later on this afternoon. But clouds and obviously the strength of the storm on the backside has brought in some cooler air. So the, the key now is um, how much of the snow will fall as a mixture of snow and rain on top of wet ground and how much of it will be just pure wet snow on top of, you know, pavement that's cooling off rapidly. You know, oftentimes people say, oh, it was really warm the day before. Uh, that's going to limit the amount of snow accumulation. That's not going to do anything. We've cooled off quite a, quite a bit. The only thing is that the ground, which is fairly wet, um, may limit some, you know, some moisture or some snowfall accumulating rapidly. But as long as the snow, as long as the snow falls quickly, it'll accumulate. So the first map was for 2 a.m. This map is for 6 a.m. And right in the heart of the middle of the morning rush hour on a Monday, uh, we're going to have snow flying and the visibility is going to be down about a half mile. Um, the winds are going to be blowing from the north northeast at about 15 to 20 miles per hour. There's not going to be any warming off the lake. Um, and it's going to be a miserable, miserable start to the work week. So uh, just as it seemed like uh, the State of the Union address was two weeks ago. It's going to seem like 70 degrees was two weeks ago as well. Yeah. No one's going to be talking about the warm weather. Everybody's going to be talking about the snow this morning, which is kind of a shame because yesterday was a beautiful day. And uh, we're looking at the totals here, uh, so, uh, predicted totals here. And uh, I, I can't quite, re well, it like, looks like four, three to four inches in the Chicago area. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, this is all going to be, um, wet snow, that's going to probably have maybe an eight to one ratio. Uh, it may start out um, more so rain across the southern areas. Um, I looked at three different models yesterday, and that was on my initial report that I sent you guys. Um, and it looks to me now that everything has kind of cooled down maybe a degree or two, and maybe it shifted a little bit further to the south. But Bottom line, whatever does fall, um, if you don't clean it up, uh, by the time we get to Monday evening and Tuesday morning, uh, whatever falls is going to probably go to that crust. So you're going to be hearing people, you know, getting up either early Tuesday morning, scrape, 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 or maybe Monday <laughs> evening when the snow ends by about three or four o'clock in the afternoon, still some flurries up until about five, um, trying to get through that first couple of inches of dry snow and then getting down to where the the wetness is kind of frozen, but yeah, a, a stark reminder that March is a very, very changeable month, and and this weekend is certainly um, showing March is capable of doing that. Well, do you want to go through uh, those maps? Are they still yeah. go, still uh, relevant uh, here, uh, starting oh, yeah. with, with yeah. uh, Sunday here? Oh, you mean you don't want to do what what Trump did, which was show a map from three days ago, and still this is going to happen the next two days? <laughs> no, no, I don't even. I I, I get you nervous. <laughs> I get nervous showing what maps that? that you sent me from yesterday. Oh no, no, I said, no! Get out it's your sharpie. Okay. <laughs> yeah, get out your sharpie. Oh my god. Oh, god. <laughs> the world is a very a very complicated place right now. Um, it really, all is. right. We don't. We don't need this, but this is basically the storm at its um, at its deepest, uh, which was basically in a perfect spot. So any of you weather weenies who are looking for areas of possibility of tornadoes, you always have to go just to the east of the low pressure area. That's because the winds are out of the south um, at the surface. Just above the surface, the winds are out of the southwest. So you get that directional change, which helps spin the air. And in the upper levels, up at about... 15 to 20,000 feet, they're out of the southwest. So the winds last night, uh, midway through the thunderstorms, get this, guys, the wind was moving at 130 miles an hour. So that means that the, the storms literally go up and get tilted. And as they get tilted, the updraft goes up and then gets tilted as well. And that's what allows them uh, to remain basically intact for such a long period of time. And that's what you call a supercell thunderstorm. And that's what you had move across um, Iowa. So the, the next area of, of, of precipitation that's going to get us um, is the one that's over um, basically parts of the desert southwest. That's what's going to hit us uh, most likely um, 
uh, most likely during the day tomorrow. Okay. And it looks uh, like Mike, you're clear. Looks like what you're doing is you're clicking through the link. You're not clicking through the maps, but that's okay. Wait, um, well, I can wait. Uh, no, these. Uh, uh, which maps do you want? I mean, I, I can, I can that's bring. Fine. Are you? That's fine. Uh, what you're showing is fine. All I said was, look, as you're clicking through the link, not the actual maps. That's fine. So, well, no, no, uh, these are this, are actually pictures that I I got that I have copied and 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 pasted here. So, uh, all right, and this is uh, this is Sunday. Uh, still, we're we're looking at and. Uh, this goes uh, into Monday here. Right. So here, this is valid then for 6 p.m. Um, Sunday. So you can see the way that next system is developing further south. So the one over Iowa yesterday is now over eastern Ontario. Uh, now notice that next one is now over um, uh, Springfield, Missouri, not Springfield, Illinois. So because it's going further south and we have a lot of cold air now in place, uh, the green that you see there approaching us will be over us for sure by about midnight. So your next map that you're going to show me is for midnight tonight. And that shows no, uh, uh, the this rain. is This is Monday, I think. Um, I'm sorry. I well, can go. Monday, March 7. Yeah. It says 06Z Monday, which is actually 12 a.m. tonight. So oh, okay. uh, this is for, yeah, this is for midnight tonight. Cause what you do is you, you subtract six hours from the six Z and that gives you uh, the current time for the Midwest. Um, a little bit of a lesson there in universal coordinated time. Um, but you can see the way the snow uh, in the in the same area, and we see this so often with um, earring outbreaks, is places that got hit with a tornado on, say, Saturday are cleaning up with snow on Monday. I mean, that happened back in the April 21st, 1967 storm that went through Evergreen Park uh, in Oak Lawn. Um, here it was, you know, you had an F4 tornado on Friday and two days later there was snow on the ground. I mean, you can actually find pictures from that event showing snow on the ground two days later because typically it's associated with a very deep um, area of low pressure. So the areas that got hit with a tornado yesterday in Iowa are going to be, you know, basically shoveling out of snow, which is a horrible thing to have to deal with. You're still picking up pieces and you got snow to deal with. So. Uh, if you go to the next map, which is going to be our 12Z Monday, uh, this is 6 a.m. Monday morning. It shows the classic track for snow for us, St. Louis to Indianapolis. And you can see right when that storm is over Indianapolis is when we're pretty much um, on the backside and you get the most lift and the most snow. So it is, it is going to be, I think this is the fourth time so far this, quote, winter season that we melt and lose all the snow and with two days, we cover the ground right back up again with more snow. Uh, so I went for a I went for a bike ride, and tomorrow I may go cross country skiing. Wow, that yeah. Well, you're you're a four uh, season sports guy, um, <laughs> and uh, then it, yeah, then I don't, two. I don't want to do that within forty eight hours though. Um, all right. So as you can see by by tomorrow evening, everything is pushed off to the east, um, and then if you want to go to the maps in for Tuesday and into Wednesday. So you can see Wednesday's map uh, is now going to show, which is the next one, is going to show another cold front coming through. And guys, this is not good news because whatever snow is on the ground tomorrow is going to be here for Tuesday. It's going to be here for Wednesday. And if you notice, when you get a Thursday's map, this, this second Arctic front is bringing in yet another shot of snow. So uh, we'll be, we'll probably have temperatures maybe upper 20s to near 30 degrees. This doesn't look like a real good potential for widespread accumulating heavy snow, but it does look like an additional one to two inches of snow on Thursday. And then you can see on the backside, ugh, Friday and Saturday just look god awful. Oh my goodness! Uh, I was just, yeah, I was just checking some of the um, forecast models. And it shows Friday morning temperatures basically in the lower teens, afternoon highs barely getting to about 25, with strong northwest winds. So temperatures on Friday will probably only be feeling like in the low 20s when the normal high is now approaching 45 to 46. So we can easily have temperatures both Friday and Saturday 20 degrees lower than normal. In fact, this coming Saturday, if you go to the next map, um, it shows the cold air basically now pulling in from the north and west, so the high to the south, 
and then the low to the north pulling that wind in. So early morning wind chills on Saturday could easily be in the single digits. Afternoon highs probably only in the low 20s. And if you do the math with the wind chills being in the, in the single di- in the in the teens by the afternoon, it's going to feel 50 degrees colder. I'm not kidding you. It's going to feel 50 degrees colder next Saturday uh, than compared to what it was this past Saturday. And so, what I'm, I'm, I'm looking at here and, and on this uh, Saturday map, that those cold winds look like they're going all the way down to the deep south. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is going to be one of those things where, you know, they've had remarkable warmth across the deep south um, over the last couple of days. Actually, actually over the last week, week and a half. Um, Atlanta was 82 for two straight days. So you know that there's a lot of plants that are budding like crazy. A lot of flowers, I should say, that are budding like crazy. And probably some trees that have already probably also flowered. So you're going to have probably freeze warnings all the way down into Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Birmingham, probably Atlanta as well uh, with this thing. And, you know, you got to remember, you know, you, people, you know, you want to race to talk about climate change. 1993, we had the storm of the century, uh, March 13th. It just happened to be, you know, two different jet streams that kind of linked up, subtropical and the polar, and created just a phenomenal amount of cold air pushing southward. So I won't rush to say that this is part of a uh, changing climate. I just think this is probably more so typical early half of March that um, we, we're glad we're getting now because, guys, this is actually a little bit of a piece of the polar vortex that has slipped southward. And if we would add this upper air pattern over us, um, say, this first and second week of January, we would probably be looking at 15 to 20 below with afternoon highs of 0 to 5 above. So, again, uh, this is 20 degrees below normal for – um, probably Friday and Saturday. So just amazing amount of cold weather that's coming at us. Um, and I think what makes it hurt is that it was so nice out yesterday. Um, it made everybody just go, I'm going outside. And even if you probably stepped outside with like jeans and a sweatshirt, you immediately went, whoa, it's warmer than I thought. Yeah. And yet it was only yeah, 8 degrees. I had the window before. open driving yesterday. It was great. Yeah. I'll, I'll, and, I'll and, tell you and, what, I, what we did in the house here is I opened the back door and front windows so I could get the air going through. And mm-hmm. the temperature in the house went up, which is just yes. oh, crazy. Yeah. For for March, yeah. that's just nuts. Uh, so. yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was the same yeah, thing. I, it was warmer I, outside I, than inside. Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> well, and the I went into... Some of it was the humidity, too, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I went to a hockey game last night at the Old State Arena, and when you got in the Old State Arena, it was colder inside than it was outside. Um, uh, but while we were inside, we actually had a couple of thunderstorms move through, uh, so you can actually hear the thunder and on the way home, you can see the lightning. So yeah, this time of the year, I mean, it's a tease. It, you know, it gets you up, then it gets you down. And then you remember that this is March in the Midwest. So, um, obviously on a day like today, the first thing you think about, um, is all the hell going on in Ukraine and then what's going to happen with you know, natural gas and heating oil and potential yeah. no-fly zones and all that stuff. And then all of a sudden you go, whoa, uh, eight people were just killed or seven people were just killed in a tornado in Iowa, um, the worst in, what, 14 years, and two of them were kids. And that just that just sucks. Those kids never got to see, um, you know, teenage land. And it's just it's stuff like that just breaks my heart. It really does. Yeah, and uh, uh, you sent this along too, and just as you can see, you were, uh, uh, this is a six to ten day temperature outlook yeah, is but, not good. And what's the chance of that changing though? Because sometimes we see oh, no. these big Zero. things, and then a week later, it's all different. Um, I don't know so much if it's a week later. They used to or, issue or these several things days later, it's all different. Yeah, yeah. I they, they used to issue these things only once a week. Now they issue them every day. That's probably one of the reasons why they may, may, may look like they change a little bit. Uh, but if you just look at the, uh, at, at the time scale, um, that's, that's a really large area of cold air. And so far, these, these act, I think, are doing a better job uh, than they've done in the past. Um, but you got to be careful because, you know, sometimes, you know, it may say above normal. And that also includes overnight lows as well. 
Um, so, I mean, if I would if I would look back at say by this coming Wednesday, what the temperatures are so far for the month of March, um, they may actually be somewhat above normal because we had a couple of days in a row where it was above normal. But it's interesting, the high temperature when it goes into the climate books for today will be what it was at 1201 which right. was, I think, 60 degrees, you know? So that, that's not the way I think climate should be. It should be adding up all the hours and then dividing by that number, then you're getting an absolute number. But yeah. being that this is how we've been doing things for the last, you know, 100 years, we're going to continue to do it that way. But I agree. There's, there's always some things, Peg, where you go, I don't know about that. But the one thing for sure is you notice even through, I think that's the 16th of March, um, it stays cold. So it's literally, it's literally two areas of cold air that are literally rotating around one another and they're pulling that colder air down across the Great Lakes. What's, what's going to be interesting is the air is cold enough where the lakes have lost a lot of their ice. We're probably going to, going to return of lake effect snow. And I think outlined by a couple of the maps there on Saturday and lake effect snow in March is very, very unusual. The one thing that I think is important to point out is that where it has been wet for the last, what, almost two months remains wet, and where it's been dry, it remains dry. So not only the 6 to 10 day, but the 8 to 14 day shows the jet basically coming across the Pacific Northwest into the Great Lakes, but those areas still across the desert Southwest, yeah. remarkably dry. It was really interesting is a couple of maps and i think this is probably it may it, it may also be in the in the the stack of data that i sent you uh but areas across california had their driest january and february uh since like 1885 um or 18, since 1895 right yeah this is and remember they got all that snow in like early december they got like four to six feet of snow and it was like and that was off of that warm pacific jet that was coming across uh, the pack Northwest and into the desert Southwest and kept us dry. Um, but look how dry it is in California. And even though they had some rain the last couple of days, it wasn't much. So again, um, I always say early season snows are never a really good indication of what your winter is gonna look like. Um, and again, just phenomenal amount of dryness um, out across the, um, the Rocky Mountains and in the desert Southwest. And with now wheat up to, I think it's what, almost $11 a bushel. It was at seven um, about two weeks ago. Um, obviously all the talk is about, you know, natural gas and heating oil. And, you know, guys, these are really tough calls for the Biden administration because if you completely, completely shut off oil imports from Russia, our gasoline goes up to five dollars a gallon easily. Now, is it a symbolic effort? Is it a symbolic message? Is it a great political win? Yeah, in the short term, it looks fantastic. But you, Biden, literally has to tell the American public, "This is what we're going to do." And if you want to do two things, you could do two things. You can go on to donateukraine.org and send a hundred bucks or don't donate ukraine.org and pay that extra money at the pump, that's basically what you're doing. He's got to go out and give a speech that says symbolically, if you want me to shut off all oil imports from Russia, fine, I'll do it. But this is what happens to our oil prices here. And at the same time, say all the things that we're trying to do from a standpoint of climate, um, resilience to oil and natural gas and still continue to think about renewable energy um, and more wind and solar, that's going to be have to put on the back burner for the next year until we get this crisis resolved. He's got to think about it in the real world because you don't want to go out and do what John Kerry said was, I'm concerned about how this affects the ability for us to control you know, climate change. While you want to say that, internally you say that, but you don't express that to the public. Because what that means is that that's more important than what's going on in Ukraine, and that's more important than basically sticking it to Putin. 
So these are really, really, really tough political pills to swallow. But I think if Biden wants to win over the largeness of the support of the American people, he's got to go out and say, all right, guys, this is what you want me to do, but this is what you need to do. You need to start paying $5 a gallon for gas until we start to drill for more oil, start to produce more natural gas, and start to at least stabilize prices globally. If he doesn't do that, he's going to lose on both ends. And, and you, you've got to do that because if you don't, uh, all, just by shutting off all the oil and natural gas from an energy standpoint, uh, it us in a global recession. And that's going to take even longer. So, yeah. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because I'll be talking about this to my Loyola students in about two weeks when they return from spring break um, and they do their projects. But this is, this, is, this is not easy. As much as I want us to completely get off of oil and coal, in the next year, that's got to be put on the back burner for, 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 keeping, for keeping the global price of gas and oil stable. Otherwise, you're going to go right back into a global recession, and, then, and then, you're, then you're screwed two years down the road. So these are not easy things to do, but um, he's president, and he's got to figure it out. Yeah, those are, you're right. They are really, really hard decisions. I do, uh, I've read in places, and Peggy and I, I think, have talked about this a little bit, that uh, I think at some points we need to talk more about sacrifice from the American people, you know, and, and I think it's not $5 a gallon. I think it could be $10 a gallon uh, if some of these things happen. Um, and if so, the American people have to say, well, I'll take mass transportation. I'll, I'll suck it up. Um, and it's hard for a lot of people because they, you know, people uh, with, on lower incomes and in situations where they can't avoid using a car, but certainly there are ways to contribute and to, to make a little bit of a sacrifice for the sake of, uh, of, of, of ending that war as quickly as possible, because the longer it drags on, the worse off we all are. So, um, but yeah, I... And it, and, it goes right, and it goes right back to our over, in, uh, over dependence on oil anyway. Yeah. Um, so when you have more of an option to go, yeah, we can do this in the short term and get by. Okay, that's fine. But you keep hearing people say, "Oh, go ahead. Now's the time to open up the Keystone Pipeline, and now's the time to drill for more." That's not the answer. No. Um, and and again, you know that, that that's why and people say using I'm not gonna- less plastics. It's not just the pump. It's plastics. It's all the petroleum products. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's that, all of those that are requiring things. it all. <laughs> right, but but it but it's hard to it's hard to preach that during this particular time because people don't want to hear that. They just well, they just don't they don't want to look at the pump and see sixty seven dollars after they fill up their car. Well, you know, you know and, and I. But if you're going to say you support the Ukrainian people, that's one of the ways you have to suck it up. You know, so it's it, yeah. like you said, they're uh, really really difficult questions, and it'll be really interesting to yeah. see how it goes. All right, we're we're way over here. Next week, I also want to talk about the climate change conference at Loyola, uh, which uh, is March 14th to 18th. Um, the intersection of climate change, human health, and justice. And boy, what an, uh, a time to have that kind of conference uh, in the world today. It'll be interesting to know what's uh, gone on in the week. Uh, just before the conference, so we'll we'll, we'll chat about that. Uh, are are you presenting at all? No, no, I am not. Okay. Um, but one of the interesting things is, whenever I walk up and down the halls of Loyola before I go to my class, I stick my head and I'll talk to the dean Nancy Tuckman or the um, head of sustainability Aaron Dunbar or Chris Peterson, and it, it's never a stick your head in. Can I just say hi for five minutes? We end up chatting for 10, 15 minutes, and you can see. Um, one of the reasons why I love so much of what I do is, you know, you, you bounce these things off of each other and we always end up sitting back in our chairs and going, oh, how do I go about couching this to the point where students who are, you know, 18, 19 years old can get it because six years ago they were 12 years old, you know, and you yeah. don't want to, you don't want you don't want to have this stuff being pushed over our heads. We're so ingrained in it all the time. And this is just one of five classes that they're taking. Um, and, and part of being forced to simplify it and, and build a very logical, rational explanation um, makes it much more imperative for us to understand all angles of it. 
um, and all objectives of it and not to get personal or too much opinionated on it. So it, it's really, really tough all the way around. Yeah. And then, you, you know, you turn on the right wing radio and everybody is yelling about how Biden sucks. And then you go, uh, but didn't Trump kind of like hold back stinger missiles asking Zelensky for a favor? I mean, no one no one remembers that kind of stuff. It's well, unbelievable. Yeah. Well, Rick DeMaio listens to right wing radio, so you don't have to. And that's uh, and <laughs> and, th- and thank you for be- sacrificing yourself to that cause. We appre- uh, we appreciate uh, it, Rick. All right. We got. I want to make that phone call. First time call of a long time listener, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. First time listener, long time caller. Okay. Uh, we will see you next week. Have a ha- enjoy your skiing this week, Rick. Yeah, the, the bike trip seems like a like I did it like a week ago already. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm not surprised at all. All right. We'll get it'll get back to it'll, it'll get back to seventy by I don't know, June, July, something like that. So <laughs> oh, oh, for our two days of spring. Yeah. Our two days of spring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Two days of spring. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll send those pictures right away after I take my dog for another walk. All right. Yeah, send those, okay. and we can identify the plans for you. All right. Good job. Okay. Take care. So long, Rick. Oh, all right. Let's get out of here. Uh, Want to thank everybody <sighs> who was boy. Uh, I know it feels like <laughs> doesn't feel like the show just lasted <laughs> four four, four days. Um, okay. Uh, Chris Bates, thank you from uh, Grower Talks. Uh, Lamanda Joy from uh, the great Grow Along, uh, Nicole Burke from Gardenary and uh, Rooted Garden. Uh, thanks to Rick DeMaio. Thanks to Kathleen doing all the stuff she does every week. Uh, thanks to Legata and uh, Basil the dog. I think we've got it right, I hope. I think so, yeah. All right, so until next time, go green or go home. And I can't find it again. Here it is. All right. Wait. No. It's here someplace. Come on, man. Bye. Bye. The whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much.